Okay, it is the top of the hour, effectively. So, okay, well, my dear brother in battle, we have just heard a uh, survival story um, from our executive producer, Mr. Uh, Pavel Edouard uh, Pravara, and uh, he's he's working on a tongue twister for me to practice that, and... Um, uh, we, we'll we'll have to do that in front of a mirror at some point, or I'll have to set aside the time for that so I can pronounce his name correctly as as the future progresses. Uh, so let me take advantage of this time to welcome everyone, and then um, I will just relate a few things on the most immediate and personal level concerning uh, my executive producer, because I do find this morbidly entertaining. And uh, then we will move on to the, um, uh, basically, uh, the transmission uh, with uh, acknowledgement, of course, of uh, people's birthdays, uh, people who are um, exceptional in their provision of uh, service and sponsorship, and, uh, uh, of course, everyone else on Team Dietrich. Uh, in, in the interim, however, um, this is a kind of uh, immediate review uh, to those of us who join in at the top of the hour uh, of the situation of our staff, so to speak, uh, for Team Dietrich. Our executive producer, uh, um, Mr. Uh, Pavel Edward Provara, has suffered a, uh, a, a collapsed tire. Uh, his tire popped. And on the way home, and uh, he had to walk on the way home uh, in a uh, very cold environment, uh, Canada, which as far as I'm concerned is like Siberia. Uh, in the interim, I do want to bring people's attentions to uh, Ramona Halitha Henry. She has published uh, the uh, Golden Star, which is uh, Showtime Live, that she um, uh, publishes with each of our transmissions. God bless her. Uh, that is on my personal friends page, of which, as far as I am concerned, uh, she be the madame thereof. So she is the closest we have to a, uh, a, 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 shall we say, a chat room monitor for um, the closest we have to a chat room, which is my personal friends page on Facebook. I do uh, recommend that everyone look for her golden star and uh, make certain to keep an eye on it as it progresses in thread uh, throughout uh, the transmission because she uh, is um, astute enough and attentive enough where she provides linkages to, uh, to vet and verify um, the subject matter to which I address. So, uh, bless her and uh, all of our love be unto her. Uh, Ramona Halitha Henry, our grandma dame. And uh, in terms of our man, uh, Pavel Pravara, uh, of course, we wouldn't be here without him. He is the executive producer. And I'm very glad that um, he made it home alive. Uh, so his uh, tire, uh, whether it was slashed or not, uh, we haven't gotten into the, uh, the details of potential for conspiracy there. Uh, but it is odd, of course, that someone on the way home to do a transmission for me uh, gets on the highway and then uh, his tire blows, uh, you know, and of course, it, worst of all possible times, uh, you know, he's got an 18 wheeler behind him, a big rig on his ass and um, has to find a, a way to uh, get safely out of the situation and then uh, trek home. Uh, thankfully, it wasn't snowing, but of course, he froze his ass and balls off anyway. And of course, we're making jokes about his own uh, controlled temperature preservation of his Sperm for future generations, uh, you know, uh, it's below 10 degrees up there. Uh, so expecting his balls to drop off and he can just store them in the fridge, uh, you know, for the next 40 years, which is how long it's uh, uh, been found that uh, we know sperm can be stored for 40 years and used uh, when it's in controlled temperature storage. I mean, that's been proven. People have taken uh, sperm that's uh, been half a century old and, uh, and actually had uh, live births uh, that uh, are resulting. Uh, after they, um, you know, just cotton swab it into their uh, into their vag. <laughs> In the meantime, uh, both the Grand Madam Ramona Alita Henry and Lena Shea send their regards and say that they are glad that uh, uh, you know, Mister. Uh, Pavel Edward Pravara is safe and among us. Uh, so I uh, want to bring that to his attention, that the ladies are looking out for him and uh, saying their prayers. And, uh, and th there you have that. Now, uh, in terms of today, this is the, uh, yes, I, I, I thank the ladies on behalf of uh, our man, uh, Mr. Pravara, uh, you know, just trying to get a hold of pronouncing that correctly. I'm probably going to irritate everyone for, for days to come till I get it right and stop saying it was such an accentuation. Uh, in the interim, uh, love the ladies with us. Uh, our fangirls, of course, uh, Lena Shea, Dianara Rishan. We have our grand 
Dan Maestro, uh, the Kali Maestro, Daniel Arola with us. Uh, we also have another martial arts master, Nathan A. Brooks, uh, another brother in battle, both of these fine gentlemen. Uh, Jackie McCandless uh, is with us. Uh, she says she can hear okay. Uh, hugs to all the brothers and to the uh, ladies among us. Mwah, just a, um, a kiss. And uh, other than that, um, one of the more immediate things that come to my spaced out addled brain is the solar return of peter moon mr peter moon is of course an individual whose uh life is heavily involved in the balkans uh is uh his young and lusty wife is uh romanian and uh he is a um wonderful human being uh will be um uh, bringing him on at some point in the future uh, and uh, I also want to give a shout out to a man who's been of tremendous service, uh, George Knight. Uh, hugs to our dear brother in battle, George Knight, out there. Uh, I'm uh, going to uh, probably take a screenshot, publish one of his latest comments. Very wonderful, very supportive. And I um, want to give a shout out, as always, to the top member of Team Dethrick, uh, the Magator, John Henry II McHills Warrington, John Warrington, the Maggot Man. And uh, the real connection to his YouTube channel will be published uh, in uh, all of my more recent uh, published posts of after transmission. I might do a specific uh, published post about it, and uh, the link is actually www.youtube.com forward slash lowercase c forward slash magotor, uh, as spelled as M-A-G-G-O-T-A-U-R, like Tor as in Taurus, the bull, like a uh, maggot bull. Anyhow, um, so our magotor is uh, the man. He has saved everything uh, from my former channel. Uh, which I will no longer name uh, for obvious reasons. And uh, without him, of course, uh, the legacy would not exist. And uh, in that sense, uh, Michael Aquino's latest conspiracy to uh, scrub me from the Internet in totality has been a spectacular failure. But what they do succeed in is, of course, um, continually st stemming or stymieing so far uh, the um, exposure of myself. Uh, very few people know of me. And uh, in a sense, uh, that's uh, some might consider that a benefit, considering what I've exposed about my uh, origins uh, at this point. Uh, but at some point, we have to uh, get out there and uh, make it known. And um, there we have that. Uh, this is being done, of course, by attentive people who are dedicated uh, on the side of the light in trying to spread the word. Uh, speaking of which, Epiphany is on this Saturday. This is the uh, Byzantine Orthodox Christian Epiphany celebrated in the rest of the world. That means Africa, Asia, and uh, Eastern Europe, the Near East, uh, as opposed to um, the West. And uh, we have a different calendar, the Julian calendar. I went to some great detail of my, in my latest transmission, which I will publish uh, either shortly after transmission or sometime thereafter. I'll probably be feeling better as soon as uh, I, I'm off, uh, off bandwidth. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I feel better while I'm on bandwidth. Uh, it was a hell of a past few days. Um, I, a lot of it had to do with um, it taking the incredible work done by my Maki benefactress. Uh, and uh, she works, of course, with volunteers uh, such as Fangirl Lena Shea. And uh, what they do is they put together some fabulous uh, um, uh, topical summaries. And uh, what I call these, I, I reference them as top sites, uh, which means that they are uh, the various uh, subjects that are um, referenced uh, while I'm burning bandwidth, and the um, many people have asked for uh, contents. So the top sites is an acronym. Uh, top T O P is an acronym for the first three letters of topics. Uh, the site acronym C I T E is an acronym for covered in this episode. So the top site or topics covered in this episode are um, uh, put forth in excruciatingly painstaking detail. Uh, by uh, my Maki benefactress with assistance, of course, from various fangirls that have put their time into this. Uh, and uh, one of them being Elena Shea. None of this would be possible without them. What I have done is taken their writings and I've translated them to extent 
in Dietrichonic. I don't put them in full Dietrichonic because that's simply utterly illegible to most people. Uh, but I take them into Dietrichonic uh, to extant, and uh, therefore what I also do is make certain that um, nothing is misinterpreted, uh, which happens to anybody, no matter how attentively that they listen. Great example would be um, the individual known as Bizarre HD. Uh, shout out to that individual. God bless them. Uh, and uh, like George Knight, I consider them a great servant uh, to humanity. And and uh, what they've done is they've rushed to my defense in, uh, in, in all manner of assaults by my gang stalkers. And in the case of Bizarre HD, one of the um, uh, strictly understandable, uh, completely understandable mistakes made in relating my genealogy was to um, think of uh, myself as having a, via my mother's side, a, a grandparent who was a Japanese male and a Chinese female. Now that is in, is is believe me, that's not a fifty fifty flip of a coin. That is something most people would understandably have concluded was the case, because obviously Japan was very much in the ascendant militarily dominant position uh, in the throughout the early 20th century. So when it comes to the Japanese imposition of itself on mainland Asia, the overwhelming majority of hybrid or mixed race marriages, uh, it would be assumed would be a Japanese male with a Chinese female or a Korean female or a Vietnamese female. And of course, such things happened. Rare as they were, because the Japanese just did not interbreed with other uh, races that often. Uh, so, um, because of the uh, enormous um, uh, barriers between cultures in Asia, which are far more formidable than those that exist between Europeans, uh, the Europeans have a far more accessible geography in the sense that Europe is a super peninsula. It is not a fucking continent let's get that straight it is re references as a continent strictly out of respect to the incredible impact it's had on the rest of the world mostly damage <laughs> that it's done to the rest of the globe and as a result because of their colonial imposition over the rest of humanity uh europeans uh reference themselves as a continent usually because of the the Brits, you know, I'm going to refrain from saying fucking Brits, of course, I'm going to be a lot kinder to the Brits as, as time goes on uh, because of the maggot man. And uh, understand, of course, uh, like many enlightened Britons, he's very cynical about uh, England and, uh, and, and, and he knows quite well the damage done by the British Empire. Uh, so he's no fool and he's no romantic in that regard. Uh, but uh, the Brits oft referred to the uh, Europeans on the mainland as the continent. They called it the continent. And uh, that's where a lot of that then was imposed on the rest of the world. Okay, it's not a fucking continent. It is a subcontinent. It is a simply a super peninsula of Asia, uh, properly, geographically, not ethnically, but geographically. Europeans are Northeast Asians. The Euro Europe is not properly Europe. Properly, when you refer to it cartographically, it's Northeast Asia. Uh, however, they are ethnically not what we would consider Asian. Uh, the British, because of their history of empire, have a bit more of a nuanced and sophisticated approach to uh, <laughs> racial matters, or at least racial discrimination. And uh, they refer to my kind of ethnicity, uh, not, not my hybridized ethnicity, but um, when I think of my acculturated background of of Asian perspective. Uh, they refer to uh, Japanese or Chinese or Koreans or Vietnamese. They call them Asians, Asians. And uh, Americans would reference them or us as East Asians because I do identify with them, of course. And uh, But uh, the Britons call them Asians and they refer to the people of subcontinental India uh, and Pakistan and Afghanistan and Tibet uh, uh, and Afghanistan, that region of Asia, they would refer to that subcontinental uh, peninsular region of Asia as Orientals, uh, because, of course, they go back to the days of navigation in their maritime empire, when uh, the navigators would orient their craft, their ship, 
uh, towards Asia for the trade. And uh, initially, Asia was not um, uh, Far East Asia. Initially, everyone was looking for India and uh, for the spices, for um, the uh, uh, the closer connection it had uh, to European sensibilities after the conquests of Alexander. And Alexander the Great's personal conversion to Buddhism and his forced conversion of his men uh, to Buddhism as he forced them into the largest mass marriage in the history of humanity, a marriage of thousands of white Europeans to thousands of Asian women, uh, in the sense the Asians being Aryan or um, uh, Iranian, as we would call them today. Persian Asians. Uh, so they wouldn't be Asians in the true sense. They're actually white, but uh, they are geographically far more Asian or deeper Asian. Uh, inner Asian. Inner Asian is the term for it cartographically uh, because it's in, in, internal to the Asian continent uh, than, let's say, the peninsular Europeans. So um, there we have that. And um, in terms of uh, the Europeans themselves, uh, again, just to kind of refine the um, ease of cultures to assimilate with each other in Europe, uh, the intermarriages between Germans, French, uh, people of uh, the Central European nations with each other, um, this became far more um, uh, expedited by the fact that they could all visit each other's uh, by the coastline. They have an incredible amount of coastline. Europe has far more coastline than any other area of the world because it's just a series of sub-peninsulas. It's a super peninsula with three sub-peninsulas, uh, the Iberian sub-peninsula, the uh, Italian peninsula, and the Balkan peninsula. And then, of course, you have the peninsulas above uh, core Europe, which are like the Scandinavian peninsula. So, so it's all peninsulas within a super peninsula, and that's Northeast Asia slash Europe. Um, so, getting out of that um, kind of uh, divergent tangent there, um, because my brain is just trying to oxygenate. Uh, I haven't even really properly caffeinated before getting on air tonight. This is probably the worst I've ever been. <laughs> Uh, let's get into some current events and maybe that'll wake me up. I took the trouble to review uh, the, the painful condition of our world around us, after which I simply wanted to retreat back into sleep again, but didn't have the opportunity. And um, we'll start, of course, with that area of the world that um, matters uh, the most. Did I, did I think of everyone else, by the way, before I went into, uh, before I go into current events, did I think of everything else to mention about uh, just people in general or people that I affiliate with, people that I care about? Um, I, I, I think I have. I, I, so um, with that, we'll just get into the current events. If I uh, remember anything else later, I'll, I'll bring it up. Um, oh, one more thing. Uh, to bring up, uh, but we'll get into it again later as I get back into the subject of nation states. Um, this um, top site uh, column, uh, the amount of work uh, that goes into it by myself uh, is, of course, compounded uh, by the fact that I'm constantly being, uh, how would I say, interrupted. Uh, and while I was trying to work on it yesterday, um, what had happened was uh, it was... Oh, fuck, what was it? <laughs> it was Byzantine Orthodox New Year, I think. Uh, did did more drugs than usual. Um, Byzantine Orthodox New Year, I think, is, is what happened recently. The 14th. It's the 14th. So, um, I partied till I forgot, you know, the world, which is the intent. Uh, came home on enough speedo drugs uh, various kinds of methamphetamines, the cathinone in particular, uh, that um, just had me sped up enough where I didn't sleep the next day. Uh, so I spent a lot of time um, adding the foreign words so people have some context, uh, at making certain that nothing was misstated uh, so that people understood uh, exactly what I was saying uh, in writing. Uh, that's what makes the top site, the topic cited in transmission of episode, so important and why people need to review that when I publish these posts that contain linkage to the bandwidth transmissions uh, once they're published by my executive producer. So uh, those uh, probably more work went into this last top site, the one I did for the Serbian Orthodox Christmas transmission, uh, than has gone into um, uh, any similar type of uh, affair. And it was compounded by the fact that I was being interrupted just ad nauseum. <laughs> by t telephone calls 
that were coming over my cell phone. Um, and uh, so when I got back to it, it is something that um, became very frustrating to publish uh, because, um, uh, bless their hearts, the young ladies who have volunteered their time, uh, either anonymously or otherwise, into this project were citing what they could find on the internet and some of these sites, while quite valid um, and, and even recommended, uh, are sensitive enough where they are blocked on Facebook. And uh, so once I um, first got it published, um, it was interpreted as spam because it was a long number of pages. Now, I know the Facebook t columns used to publish 17 pages worth would be allowed, about 17 pages worth of text. They may have lowered that, but I don't think so. Um, and it was simply the nine pages of text with all of the foreign language uh, and links was enough to throw it off uh, in terms of an automatic reading from the uh, various uh, aggregate machines that they've got as a um, spam. So it was just outright blocked at first. And then I had to locate the offensive links and finally um, found one, which was actually a research blog uh, that uh, brought up a lot of information about May Man in Brussels. And uh, that was considered something too controversial for Facebook. Uh, almost certainly, I can guarantee fucking to you this, having nothing to do with my personal bias because of the amount of information exposed about Michael Aquino, it's guaranteed Michael Aquino got it on the off list for venues like Facebook. And so that's actually the, the most important of all the links. And so I'll try and find a way to direct people to that particular blog spot in the near future. The link is in the hands of our man, uh, Pavel. Um, he might help me figure out a way to do that. Uh, you know, obviously I can't publish it, the link on Facebook. So we'd have to reference other people to it. But once I got rid of that link, I was able to publish the top site and integrate it into uh, the the post. I had to do it uh, the tricky way by getting the post published first and then editing it, which, of course, when it was originally blocked, you can't edit what's blocked. So um, and, and so just an enormous amount of work went into that. So review it and um, I'll be bringing it up during the transmission. Now, uh, in terms of uh, world politics and geography, I always start with Asia, of course, and uh, that is where South Korea will pay more for it. The Trump administration is in a standoff with South Korea because South Korea is an anti-communist ally of the United States uh, that, uh, of course, as an um, ally of Vladimir Putin, as a puppet of Vladimir Putin, uh, Donald Trump is going to fuck South Korea, and uh, he's going to fuck them over uh, via the cost of basing troops there. Uh, United States negotiators want a 50% increase in Seoul, that's the capital of South Korea, uh, for all our listeners out there. Um, and uh, the ignorance in terms of geography is appalling, so I always have to remind myself to actually explain to people uh, when I bring up a geographic location, uh, of course, people will think it's like a pop star or something. You know, Seoul, you know, oh, uh, she got out of CD, you know, something like that. So I have to explain that fact. That, that, now, there's pop bands all over Seoul, of course. You know, that's what the Koreans churn out is uh, an entertainment industry. They're, they're Asia's Hollywood. And uh, they um, have uh, some of the most beautiful women in the world do the fact that everyone in South Korea, and I mean everyone, that's not an exaggeration. This is like a gift that's given to girls as like a coming of age gift. Every girl in South Korea, and I mean every girl, because they've got a high quality, a high standard of life, high, high standard ec economic, uh, um, you know, they're, they're one of the giants of Asia. So in terms of economy, one of the tigers, the Asian tigers. So um, the girls, when they come of age, the uh, meaning when they turn about 16 or 17 years old, uh, they're given a gift of plastic surgery. And uh, so they are the most cosmeticized uh, nation on earth that there's no one no one has the level of plastic surgery uh, operations going on like they do in South Korea. This is why they're the Hollywood of Asia. And uh, so they churn out pop bands like like that. So, um, you, you know, uh, Seoul would actually not be unexpected to be affiliated with that thought to come up in someone's mind as a celebrity or a uh, or, or something. So at any rate, it's the capital of South Korea. And uh, the United States negotiators want a 50 
fucking percent increase in Seoul's annual payment uh, to the cost of basing American troops there. In other words, you're under occupation by the United States and they want you to pay for it. How fucked is that? that well, that's Donald Trump fucked. That's, that's Trump fuck right there. That's like, you know, that's like, that's like raping some chick and then asking her to pay you for it. That's, that's, <laughs> that's what that's like. Uh, but that's, that's America for you. That's, that's Trump. That, that's your typical white guy right there. You have to think you're doing you a favor. You know, they, they throw down some ethnic chick on the floor and, uh, and they pork her and they, they, they think they're doing a favor when they're just giving her more yellow kids. Anyhow, um, they, um, that, that payment, by the way, that they want the 50% increase on. If I remember correctly from last year, that was approximately 830 million United States dollars. So uh, they want that plus half. Uh, so South Korea is expected to make a counter offer soon amid fears that Trump could threaten a, uh, a total troop drawdown, you know, just like he's done in uh, Syria at a time of sensitive diplomacy when they're trying to make peace for the first time in half a century with North Korea. And, of course, uh, North Korea is, uh, if anything, uh, a satellite state not of communist China, though it deals heavily with communist China, and China is trying to destroy South Korea. Uh, the um, but North Korea and South Korea both deal heavily with Russia. They both have heavy economic uh, uh, integration with Russia uh, because Russia's got no population uh, to do a work in uh, the Russian Far East, in on, on in the Russian Pacific areas. So everyone who does any, not only do they not have enough people to do work, the people who are there are totally fucking incapable of working because they're motherfucking Russians and all they do is drink. Hate to say it, <laughs> that's that's reality. I'm not a Russophobe at an irrational level where I personally hate Russian people. Uh, but the, the the biggest challenge that anyone has, if they ever went to Russia, especially in areas outside of the regions where they have total control over the immediate environment, like in Moscow, uh, further away you go off into frontier areas, you may as well drop off the fucking planet. And uh, all they do, and uh, this is what the USGIs were saying when they invaded the Russian Far East back uh, in World War I, uh, the USGIs were saying, Jesus fucking Christ, all anyone does here is drink. That's it. That's all they do. And uh, so no one shows up for work. There's no one there capable of working. They're, 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 they're too busy with the DTs, the deliriums, tremens. They couldn't even hold a tool. Their, their hands would be shaking too much. Uh, they couldn't even rivet. You know, you'd have a construction that would fall apart at the base level. Uh, so they hire South Koreans to do all that shit. Uh, and uh, so um, and and of course, what they have is a uh, a, a huge amount of South Koreans now living uh, on the areas that the Japanese are trying to reclaim. Uh, so uh, th there you have that. That's that's the situation up there for uh, far eastern Russia. And uh, so the Americans are trying to fuck over the South Koreans. And you would think that uh, Putin would interfere because he needs him to do his work. Uh, we'll see if that happens. In the meantime, uh, Trump's just trying to fuck everybody before he goes down. Uh, and, of course, another person going down is uh, Theresa May. Well, she'll survive. Uh, but like I said, she's a dead May walking. Uh, she's faced yet another test after the historic defeat of her Brexit proposal. Uh, opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn put forward a no confidence motion that was debated uh, and came to a vote. Uh, and um, she survived this no confidence vote by parliament after her Brexit debacle. And I think it was yesterday. Um, I, 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 totally losing track of immediate time which is fine as far as i'm concerned uh i think it was yesterday or sometime within the last 48 to 72 hours Theresa may lost the parliamentary vote on her brexit deal by 230 votes the largest ever defeat for a ruling party in britain uh british prime minister Theresa may survived uh this parliamentary vote of no confidence uh wednesday um okay paul says it was yesterday tuesday was the day yeah i think tuesday was yesterday i'm pretty sure it was and uh, so this was the largest ever defeat for a ruling party in Britain. Uh, she's got that to her record now. Oh, fuck. <laughs> British Prime She's She's basically, uh, I think it was today, actually, now that I think about that. Uh, the parliamentary vote of no confidence was Wednesday, wasn't it? Which is today, right? 
Yeah, and uh, and the lawmakers, of course, rejected the move against her government by a vote of 325 to 306. So her government's expected to survive, uh, but a loss paves the way for the United Kingdom's third general election in four fucking years. Okay, all of this uh, as uh, socially engineered by the motherfucking Russians who have uh, been responsible for Brexit. They were the people who hacked the vote for the Brits that brought them to Brexit just as they hacked the vote that brought us Donald Trump. Both of these are international catastrophes. Fuck the national level. These are at the international level. The global level, they impact all humanity. They impact human evolution for generations to come. Uh, now in England, there be demands for Theresa May to extend Article 50, which set a deadline for Brexit to happen on March 29th. But this may mean Britons have to vote for members of the European Parliament in elections due in May. So you've got extra time and penalties. Extending Article 50 may mean Britain must elect ministers of European Parliament. Again, that would cause complications since many seats for British ministers of European Parliament have been reallocated to other European Union nations, all of which need to agree to an extension. Okay, so this will probably lead to the uh, worst possible scenario, which is Brexit with no deal. Uh, Britain is going to be in a sink or swim mode. This is what I personally predict in that it's going to have to adapt. And unless they follow my advisements, uh, which is basically if they want a third empire, um, they've got to go beyond this offshore account bullshit, uh, which is just an illegitimate e illegal empire. Well, all their empires were, <laughs> but aside from the fact that it would be an empire based on criminality, uh, which is basically law money laundering, uh, and all their empires were based on criminality, albeit at the far more genocidal level, uh, they could do better than that. They could do good for the world based on what I said by a pan-Semitic empire. Now, I know the Jews in Israel are overwhelmingly uh, ethnically not Semitic. Uh, they are Hazar, they are Turkic. Uh, but uh, the, nevertheless, there are uh, true Semites in Israel. There are Shafardim uh, peoples there. And, um, and yes, there are decent people in, in, in Israel. There are decent people in Russia. There's decent people all over the world. The fucking problem is none of them in places like Israel or Russia are doing anywhere near enough. Uh, of course, who could blame them? They're scared to death. But, hey, look what I do on a daily level uh, based on death threats I receive. So, fuck it. They've got no excuse. Uh, it, uh, they're as evil as all the rest if they do nothing. So um, they ha that has to be held against them until something is done. And, uh, and Israel and Russia both need a lot to be done. So um, in the case of that, uh, however, the British can step in. And as I say, since, um, the, since they killed Jesus, uh, whether it was the Jews or the Romans, uh, we don't need to pin blame uh, specifically at the moment, or, or perhaps not ever. Um, but uh, at any rate, they, um, the Romans and the Jews, but mm, mm, most people would agree it was mostly the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> who demanded it, since they killed the actual king descendant of the Davidian line, their own Mashiach, Mashiach their own Messiah, uh, who fulfilled their own prophecies. Uh, you know, God comes in and they, and they fuck him over and kill him. Uh, they um, uh, need a different king. So the British can step in and coronate uh, the... Um, Rothschilds as the uh, king of uh, Malkuth Israel or Kingdom Israel. And uh, that would, of course, be uh, united in kingdom with the British. If they lose Scotland and Wales, uh, they can create another united kingdom, a united kingdom of uh, Britain and Israel. Uh, and, of course, uh, I do foresee a, a split of Israel, as is actually historical, as what happened with Vietnam. Vietnam, long before the uh, northern communist severance uh, f and demarcation from the uh, Republican South, uh, into North and South Vietnam, the Republic of Vietnam in the South and the People's Republic of Vietnam in the North. Uh, back in the days of the uh, Chinese and Mongol empires, there was a North and South Vietnam. Uh, so history simply repeated itself, and it does tend to do that. Uh, you look at the case of Germany. Uh, Germany has suffered many divisions in its history. The Romans originally built the Limes Wall, which was the furthest northern limits of Pax Romanum, or the enforced peace of Rome, 
and uh, the Limes Wall became the division line culturally between uh, Protestant Germany and Catholic Germany. Uh, the Roman Catholics were south of the Limes Wall. The Protestant uh, Germans were north of the Limes Wall. That was a difference between north and south, a division thereof. Uh, the original division of East and West Germany was uh, that of uh, the Charlemagne's Christian Empire, uh, which was the foundations for the First Reich, the Holy Roman Empire, which saw a united Germany on the Reich of the realm. But uh, the original uh, geographic manifestation of that empire uh, was based on the limits of Charlemagne's uh, realm, which extended easterly, uh, but stopped in a division line of Charlemagne's Christianization of the pagan Germani tribes. And uh, these were, of course, pagan tribes that uh, worshipped uh, the god of the woods, the god of the forest. The aurochs of the arboreal world worshipped Odin, uh, the great uh, Norse Viking uh, war god, the father of all gods, uh, who wore, of course, an antlered helm, an antlered helmet, making it very similar to the horned devil. And he was uh, bedeviled uh, by propaganda when the Germans were Christianized. Uh, much of where we get our um, uh, very um, a northern arboreal forest look for Satan comes from the uh, Roman Catholic Church's literal demonization of the original German pagan gods. Uh, and they conflated that image onto the original Seth Anne of the ancient Egyptian anti-god, the, the, the devil of the uh, ancient Egyptians, which existed long uh, before there was a concept of Christ in the West, but there had always been Christianity in the East, as I explained in my Christmas transmission. Now, uh, when it comes to the uh, Charlemagnean Empire, uh, which was capitaled in Aachen, uh, there, that was a division line between East and West Germany that was along the exact same lines as that of the divided East and West Germany after the uh, cessation of prosecution of proactive uh, hostilities in World War II on the surface world. Uh, that division line created between East and West Germany was simply a redrawing of the Charlemagne line. Uh, so Germany's been bifurcated between East and West and North and South many times in the past uh, to unite into realm again. And that's every time it unites is when you have the realms of the Reichs. Germany right now is not united. What you simply have is the unification of a truncated uh, core or central Germany East Germany is not yet united, and that is the area that's occupied by the fucking Poles. You know, fuck them. I'm sick of calling them Polacki or being respectful. I mean, the way they're behaving these days. Uh, the most white supremacists, the most ignorant white supremacists, backwards ass cult, ass, ass backwards culture in Europe is Poland and Hungary and these uh, fucking members of the Visegrad group, headquartered, of course, in my uh, executive producer's homeland, uh, Prague. Uh, you know, all the bastards who are just communist apparatchiks, the former hacks of the Communist Party have gotten together and uh, created a white supremacist movement in uh, aligned with Vladimir Putin. They just want to go behind the Iron Curtain again. So it'll take war to liberate these motherfuckers, and it'll take war to liberate the world from motherfucking Russia. And uh, right now they're doing incredible damage to us, and I'll get into some of that. Um, but in the meantime, uh, a little geography lesson over there never hurt. Now, I think there was a reason for my bringing it up, not that there needs to be, but um, let me get some of this tea. Mm. Now, um, the reason I brought that up while thinking about it, with Vietnam, the demarcation line between North, and Viet, uh, North Vietnam and South Vietnam during the uh, Third Indochina conflict, uh, which the Americans called the Vietnam War and the Vietnamese called the American War, was the exact same demarcation line from the days of the Qing dynasty and the Mongol invasions. And uh, there was a North and South Vietnam at that time, and uh, they defeated the Chinese, they defeated the Mongols uh, with the use of their secret weapon uh, in war, the elephant. Um, and uh, the elephant for them was an unbeatable armored machine. Uh, that drove back the forces of both China and ultimately the Mongols, who were able to occupy 
each time only the northern half of the Indochinese Peninsula, uh, resulting in a South Vietnam, an independent South Vietnam. And uh, very similar to the situation with the communists and their uh, overrunning the north. Uh, they're being stopped at that demilitarized zone in the south. So these uh, demarcations repeat themselves again and again throughout history. We're not going to see an exact type of demarcation in this civil war in the United States between north and south again because Dixie has been totally bifurcated into both a black and white realm, a new Africa and uh, the Second Confederacy could never again be referred to as a Confederate states because it's no longer white at the state level. It's white at the county level. So a Confederacy of whites uh, is inevitable to arise. I say let them have their secession. Uh, let them align with motherfucking Russia after we get rid of Vladimir Putin. And uh, But um, uh, as far as that's concerned, um, they are um, basically going to be a region. Um, it'll be similar in uh, border gore, uh, meaning a kind of a very convoluted uh, border uh, situation, as we have in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, in the former Yugoslavia. And uh, that's uh, in that sense, you have a demarcation of Serbs and everyone else. In uh, this case, it'll be a demarcation of uh, the New Africans or Blacks of the Deep South and the Whites of Dixie. Uh, now, part of what's going to bring us to that is, of course, this government shutdown. Uh, inevitably, um, it will have very long-term repercussions. Um, people who don't appreciate uh, the government shutdown and its ramifications, of course, uh, don't appreciate it because they've never worked as federal employees. Now, I've worked at all three levels of government have held responsible positions, many of them armed, uh, some of them far more powerful than being armed, uh, as when I was a Department of Defense Research Librarian, there's far more responsibility uh, involved with that than when you carry a gun. Uh, I've worked at the federal, the state, and the municipal level of government. So as a former government employee at all levels, I have an appreciation for what the shutdown is doing that drove me to blot out the fucking world over the every opportunity I get, uh, such as the recent uh, Serbian Orthodox Christmas and New Year's parties uh, celebrations. So um, coming back down to the ground, uh, I look at the world around me and my eyes are blinded by the, by the, fuck, what do I call it? <laughs> The search beam of despair uh, that has overwhelmed this nation because of motherfucking Russia, goddamn Vladimir Putin, and your cocksucking faggot president, Donald Trump. Damn be his soul to the flames of hell eternal. So, let me try and help you appreciate what the fuck is going on. We have 380,000 federal workers furloughed and not being paid. We have 420,000 federal employees who are working without pay. We have many tens of thousands of contractors who rely on the federal government but are not full-time employees who are not being paid and will not be receiving any back pay. Now, they may appeal this, and this is a process similar to a lawsuit that will take years to pursue and become a vestigial career in and of itself. It'll become their second job just to campaign to get that back pay. In the January jobs report, most of the workers who have been furloughed will be counted as unemployed affecting the unemployment rate with nearly 50 fucking percent fully goddamn half of the US FDA, the United States Food and Drug Administration off the job due to the shutdown some agency employees are predicting that the safety and health of the American public will be impacted and hundreds Potentially thousands of people will die. 
No one's making food inspections. People are getting away literally with plasticizing steak, melting steak, colorizing it, you know, melting plastic, colorizing it, adding it into people's hamburger, which was fed to a bunch of black football players when Trump bought thousands of these McDonald's patties, I believe. Highly flavored, plasticized shit. <laughs> The TSA, which if I remember is an acronym for the Transportation Security Administration workers, have engaged in sick outs to silently protest being forced to work without pay or to take temporary jobs in order to pay their bills, which is something government workers normally never have to do because, of course, they're highly privileged and they're paid mostly for doing shit. But what little bit they do when they get around to doing it is vital enough. Now, I can't overemphasize this because my mind goes back to it as a person who is a single male, a bachelor. Of course, I get home delivered meals from Meals on Wheels, but that's a lot of that is subsistence food. But I've become much more cautious about eating out because of the FDA ceasing inspections of food, including fruit, meat, seafood, and vegetables. Now, this is confirmed by the agency's administrator himself. It's not something that I'm speculating on. It's just all your food that you're buying off the shelf from Safeway is no longer inspected. We had people dying of E. coli for years now. We might now get scores of deaths that could turn into hundreds or thousands. Now, from the economic perspective, pending company mergers are being slowed because the Securities and Exchange Commission isn't fully staffed. The Department of Justice has asked for a delay to a lawsuit that could invalidate the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, under which millions obtain health insurance. Federal contractors could be losing a combined 200 million United States dollars per day. Now, this I got while trying to look at the world around me and catch up, trying to come down, decompress from Serbian Orthodox New Year's. And I was reviewing an analysis by Bloomberg government. So our domestic economy is being destroyed by Donald Trump. And this is Vladimir Putin's way of getting back for the sanctions against himself and his oligarchic mafia. Fuck you, Donald Trump. Fuck you, Vlad. Fuck all you goddamn motherfucking Republicans. Eat shit and die. If you're a Republican, eat shit and die. Republicans are scum of the fucking earth. If you're a Republican, kill yourself. Fucking kill yourself. Drown your babies in the bathtub so we don't have your genes. <laughs> just propagating themselves in the goddamn pool of human existence and fucking up our evolution for generations to come. You don't deserve to reproduce. Oh. Now, SNAP benefits, which I am not on, but my former executrix producer, Laura Lee Solomon, is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. What you used to call food stamps. There's no stamps anymore. They have cards. It's like a credit card. SNAP benefits will eventually be curtailed. They should be able to continue through February, according to the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. Now, here we have a program that provides food assistance to over 7 million low-income pregnant women, new mothers, and young children, the WIC. And uh, I forget what the WIC acronym is for. I'll um, ask my uh, executive producer to look that up for me. It's uh, been a long time uh, since I've ever even dealt with uh, assistance programs. And uh, I believe that's simply an acronym for Women, Infants, and Children. So if I'm remembering that correctly, the Women, Infants, and Children's Program, uh, which, as I said, provides food assistance 
to over 7 million low-income pregnant mothers, new mothers, and young children. Has funding that will last through the end of this month, through January. After that, there's no more money. Now, there's a watch group called After Nature, which has reported repairs to one of Hubble's telescope's main instruments. Might have to wait until after the shutdown. As clarified on January 11th by NASA, the National uh, Aeronautics and Space Administration, uh, they claimed the repairs would not be delayed. Now, I am not at all uh, confident that what NASA says is going to be the the reality. I know for a fact the ATCs, the air traffic controllers, when I think back on the TSA situation, the air traffic controllers have missed their first paychecks on January 10th. They received pay stubs showing net pay of $0.00, what I used to get as a care provider while caring for my parents because every fucking penny I earned went back into what was called share of cost for the state of California, so I could maintain both of my parents on civilian insurance because all the military bases had closed and they could not get free treatment at military bases. My father could get taxpayer-covered treatment at the Veterans Administration, but his wife could not, my mother, because she had not been treated at the VA prior to the age of 65 because she was going to military bases for medical treatment as a military spouse and a military dependent. So when I shut down all the military bases in, well, shut down the Presidio military base, and then subsequent budget cuts shut down all the rest of the bases in the greater San Francisco Bay Area Metroplex region, then what happened uh, was that uh, my parents couldn't go to military bases for treatment, and I had to get my mother on civilian insurance because she couldn't transfer into the VA like I could ultimately get my father transferred into by getting him recognized for all of his war-based injuries that I suffered in three different conflicts, which, of course, my gang stalkers have forged documents claiming he never served in these conflicts, when, of course, he's got a tombstone, a headstone at Walcott Cemetery that was provided in by the Veterans Administration on his death that says he's a veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Now, of course, my primary gang stalker, Richard K. Cole, also known as Randy Allen Kramer, and Stuart Allison for his child porn films that he produced for the Marine Corps, and the Marine Corps directly had a child porn production ring involved in San Diego out of Pendleton, Camp Pendleton, and San Diego Marine Corps Recruit Depot, which I did shut down because I accepted the investigation for that. Uh, and, of course, I was under orders to travel from Iraq to actually have sex with this motherfucker and a film that they hoped would make me a big-time star in the Marine Corps production of such pornography. But, of course, I evaded that by getting dishonorably discharged. Uh, He never forgave me for not fucking him. He's been after me ever since. Uh, This individual in uh, collusion with a man who now died in his attempt to attack me, John Victor Lillier, uh, forged documents saying my father was never in the military. And when they couldn't get away with that, then they altered documents Say my dad never served in conflict when his tombstone says World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. But, of course, Richard K. Cole says he's destroyed that tombstone. He lives in Prattsburg, New York, and he says he traveled all the way to Walcott and destroyed my father's headstone on the cemetery. Now, it's so out of the fucking way, this Walcott Cemetery. I've never been able to get anyone up there to visit it and actually confirm whether my dad's headstone, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, still stands or not. So if anyone ever has a chance to take an expedition out there, because it's out in the middle of... Once you park your car, which they allow you to drive it through the cemetery because the cemetery is that fucking forlorn and vast. Uh, You can drive to the headstone, step out and uh, check if it's still there for me. Uh, You'll have to ask the people at the church exactly where the headstone is uh, because, you know, once you're out there, you might as well be in the fucking woods. You are in the fucking woods. Uh, At any rate, um, so uh, that comes to my mind, of course, whenever I think of uh, caring for my parents. And uh, because they were military or military dependent, and I had to fight to get my dad recognized for uh, war-related injuries that got him 100% disability, that got him treatment at the VA. Couldn't get that done with my mother, but to get her treated by Medicare and Medi-Cal, I had to get her recognized uh, as such 
And the only way to do that was to get her husband on civilian insurance, meaning Medicare and Medi-Cal. So I had to get them uh, unprecedentedly. This is supposed to be totally illegal. I got them to change the laws. I had to campaign and uh, actually legally represent my parents. And these courts of laws are not normal courts of laws. These are not law courts of law where you have like a uh, representative and a jury. Uh, these are like communist law. You are representing yourself and you are at the caprice and whim of state administrative law judges who turn your own home into a court of law. They come and visit you and uh, your home is turned into a court of law and they have representation and you don't. So I was turned down innumerable times. I won only because San Francisco, the city and county, was going broke fighting me, and they had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars resisting my campaign and finally just shut it down by making my parents uh, accessible to civilian insurance, even though my dad was a veteran, but I had to pay for it. So I was recognized as a care provider, so I had to give my Social Security. I was given Social Security because my lungs collapsed seven times due to a exposure to cyclosaurine nerve gas in Desert Storm. Uh, tonight, by the way, uh, is the uh, commemorative Eve Day memorial date of Desert Storm, Operation Desert Storm commencing, which was January 17th. So this is the Memorial Day Eve Day for the commencement of Operation Desert Storm. I'm not going to talk about it other than to say that uh, because I spend all my life trying to fucking forget it. Not because I saw any combat in Desert Storm worth anything uh, mentioning, uh, but because of other things that led to my dishonorable discharge and the politics thereof, of course, which I've been paying for the rest of my life, uh, with, uh, of course, gang stalkers assigned by Michael Aquino of the United States Army and the Marine Corps, you know, all personified in uh, people like uh, from the Army, John Victor Lillier, now dead after attempting to uh, assault myself physically. And, of course, uh, some would argue that it is metaphysical and it's assault. Uh, it, it really is the same difference. And, of course, uh, the Randy Allen Kramer, Martian Marine puke, uh, Richard K. Cole. So all of these people, uh, this is what I get out of my service, is nonstop stalking. Uh, and uh, these are people who uh, use the Marine Corps Eagle Globe and Yanker to represent themselves. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, since the Marine Corps doesn't shut them down, then, as far as I'm concerned, they're indirectly responsible. So, there we have that. And uh, all these losers uh, struggle against me, and I had to struggle against their organizations to get my father into the VA and then get my mother onto civilian insurance by getting him simultaneously and parallel onto civilian insurance, which I had to pay for. So, the injuries I suffered in Operation Desert Storm resulted in my physically getting Social Security because of mechanical injuries, my lungs collapsing several times because that was an undeniable injury. Uh, obviously, I suffered spontaneous pneumothoraces. These were undeniable medically, and so my combat injuries being undeniable, I couldn't get benefits from the Veterans Administration or treatment there because I was dishonorably discharged. By the way, that's why I'm still alive, because the VA treatment's the worst in the fucking world. And instead, I went to UCSF, which conducted highly experimental, radical advanced technology surgery and stapled my lungs to my ribcage by unhinging my lower jawbone, unstrapping my lower jaw, and going in through my throat to thoracically staple my lungs to my ribcage. Now, all of that resulted in my getting Social Security. When I became care provider for my parents so I could get them insured, I had to give up my own Social Security. So I went without Social Security for the 11 years that I was caring for my parents, and I went without pay because the pay that I got cycled back into paying the state for their insurance and the share of cost took everything I had, so all of my checks said 0, 0.00. Now, in because I was caring for my parents on a 24-hour-a-day basis for both of them, meaning I was working 48 hours a day, since both of my parents required 24-hour-a-day care as recognized by the state of California, then I was caring for both of my parents together 48 hours a day. There was no break, even though I was perforce a member of the largest healthcare union in the world, uh, at that time, the local 250 SEIU, a very large healthcare workers union, I had to pay union dues, but I couldn't get union people to replace myself as a care provider so I could take a vacation because then they would have had to pay the share of cost. And since none of them were willing to do that, I was always on my own 24 hours a day, 48 hours a day, technically, taking care of my parents. And I did this for 11 years until both of them were dead. During that period of time, every paycheck I received said 0.00, but in cyberspace, I'm making more money than the president of the United States. 
and I was taxed on every dollar by the United States government. So after my parents died, I was going to go to jail for federal tax evasion because I had no money to pay taxes. So I had to employ an attorney for tens of thousands of dollars to pay tens of thousands of dollars in taxes to the United States government and have them talk down because we couldn't get rid of them claiming taxes from me, even though I never received any of the money. I had to pay taxes on all the money I never received. So I paid half a hundred thousand dollars, about fifty thousand dollars in taxes for money I never received. And I had to pay twenty five thousand dollars to a tax attorney to talk that down from hundreds of thousands of dollars. So not only did I have to take care of my parents with a zero point zero zero paycheck every two weeks, I had to pay fifty thousand dollars to do that. But that's how much I love my parents. This is what I had to do. And I had to pay another twenty five thousand dollars to an attorney to stay out of jail. This wasn't an accountant, mind you, like a CPA. This was a tax attorney, actual attorney, to keep me out of jail with the IRS. So that was my life. And if anyone bitches that they've had a hard life, harder than Douglas Dietrich, obviously, you're full of shit. No one on earth, no one on fucking earth has had a harder life than Douglas Dietrich. <laughs> this is what I can tell you. So when I spend all my time drinking, when I spend all my time drugging, when I live off Meals on Wheels, and I get Social Security Disability Insurance now. I more than earned all of this, including my service to your fucking republic in the Marine Corps, only to earn a bunch of gang stalkers because I wouldn't produce pornography for the fucking Corps. So all you stupid veterans of the Marine Corps, you're all a bunch of faggots. Your uniforms look like shit. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, we can stop it there for now, though I could go on for hours. And that brings us to the concept of service. Thousands of Secret Service agents are working without pay through this government shutdown. So the men who guard Donald Trump aren't getting paid. At a prison in Greenville, Illinois, where prison employees work without pay, they're having trouble finding workers to staff overtime shifts. Uh, I read that in the Bellevue News Democrat when I was going around online trying to find headlines. Uh, and I know that federal prison workers in Florida's panhandle we're already having to commute 400 miles because of Hurricane Michael. They'll have to keep doing it without paychecks or expense reimbursement for now. <laughs> Think about that. Uh, I'm sure most of you are still stuck on tripping off the air traffic controllers, uh, getting their uh, pay stubs with a net pay of 0.00. .00. You know, well, suck you, motherfuckers. I got that for, what, 11 fucking years. All of you are finally beginning to realize now as federal workers what I had to suffer through over a decade of uh existence doing uh so the government shutdown is making uh douglas dietrich's out of everybody of course the problem is uh they all deserve it as opposed to myself <laughs> the um now the department of housing and urban development hasn't been able to renew roughly 1650 contracts with private building owners who rent units to thousands of low-income tenants who rely on the federal government to help pay the rent so we're going to have a massive problem there. Food programs, now that I think about that again, health care and paychecks, they're all left in doubt for Native American tribes, of course, when I think of my potential Native American background. And, of course, we have states like Oklahoma delaying contracts for new road and bridge work because of the uncertainty of federal funds. The Smithsonian's 19 museums in and around Washington District of Columbia have all been closed. The National Zoo is closed while the animals are being cared for by workers who are not being paid. They're just animal lovers who are going back to work because they don't want the animals to die. Maybe people can volunteer to help them clean up the shit. They need somebody to sweep. Uh, I know that the popular panda cam has been turned off because I went to look at it. <laughs> so the panda cam is off. We can't pay for the goddamn panda cam. Uh, what else comes to mind? Uh, oh my God. Um, overflowing toilets. Now that I think about the national parks, there's nobody, uh, to maintain the plumbing. So we've got overflowing toilets and other hygiene, public hygiene and safety concerns. Uh, that's forced parts of Joshua Tree National Park in California to close. I know that because that was a favorite place for Noreen Helphand, girl who used to work with me on Revolution Radio. Give me a second here. Mm -hmm. Reminds me to give a shout out to Harold and Noriko Sampson, used to be a friend of hers. Um, the National Park Service 
is using money for future projects to keep some parks open. And that's drawing criticism that the funds are being misused. Uh, at Yellowstone National Park, which borders us, my golden state, some private companies that run tours have been performing some maintenance to keep facilities open. Uh, I know that much. Uh, what else comes to my mind when I think of uh, national parks? Um, I think of the uh, natural uh, disasters. <laughs> the National Hurricane Center is getting off schedule for badly needed upgrades to the main American weather model. I know that. Uh, border patrol agents are still working, as far as I can ascertain. Uh, but I know they're working without pay. So there's Trump's border security for you there. Yeah, he's going to need a wall. Because there's going to be nobody fucking working the goddamn border. Some border patrol officers have sued the Trump administration, as a matter of fact. I know that. Uh, over the missing pay. So there goes Mr. Border Security himself. You know, if, if you like Trump, your head is so far up your fucking ass, you're high on your own fumes. You must be the dumbest person in the world. Let me say this to your face. If you're a Republican, you're already a piece of shit. You shouldn't be alive. If you actually like Donald Trump, you, I mean, at this point, you're just a criminal. Uh, there's no other word for it. Only a criminal would like another criminal. And most criminals don't even like other criminals because of competition. But at any rate, I know the backlog in immigration cases is growing as many immigration courts are closed. Employers can't use the federal system. That means people who actually hire people and produce jobs can't use the federal system, e-verify, to confirm whether workers are in the United States legally or not. Now, I just thought of that. <laughs> but think about what I'm saying in terms of Mr. Border Security, Mr. Anti-Immigrant there. Uh, he was encouraging everybody, don't hire the illegals. Well, E-Verify, which I checked into, can't be used now because it's shut down, because of his government shut down. So they can't confirm whether people are here illegally or not. So you may as well start hiring the illegals. This is thanks to Donald Trump. So all the shit he's saying about border security, about immigrants, it's all just that. Shit. Oh, my God. I, you know, I know that there's a um, owner of a small IT company, an information technology company. And uh, um, anyhow, I, I hear we're getting buffering and cutoffs. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm getting that from Ramona Halitha Henry that uh, where Sammy Romero just 33 minutes ago said we were sounding clear. Uh, but I'm told that uh, we, as soon as I started saying uh, shutdown, or talking about the shutdown is when we started getting cutoffs. Well, at least we're recording it. I'll have Pavel look into it. If anyone else can tell me about the um, quality of our uh, production, uh, it's not the production itself that's at fault, mind you. Uh, but what we're getting is a uh, interference. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, I, I do want you to know that the um, probably my exposing the damage that's being done by Donald Trump is highly sensitive because the government doesn't want you to know just how fucked you are. <laughs> how deep up your ass Donald Trump's cock is. And then he's going to take that shit covered ass and he's going to stick it in your mouth and make you lick it clean. OK. All right. Uh, going back to that small IT company, the information technology company in North Carolina, uh, it can't close on a small business administration loan that's already been approved for a new commercial property. So the owner of that particular IT corporation uh, is going to probably lose the property along with all the money he sunk into appraisals and fees. Uh, so, um, you know, bad as my life's been, you know, uh, that guy's pretty fucked. Uh, I'm told that the stream is going well by our executive producer, uh, Mr. Pavel Edward uh, Provara, and uh, thank you, sir. Now, farmers who would normally be looking are to a January 11th monthly report on the supply and demand of agricultural products to help determine what to plant next season are going to have to wait if the United States Department of Agriculture remains closed uh, because that's already overdue and it hasn't come out. So farmers aren't going to know what to plant for next season based on supply and demand. 
So that's going to fuck up our distribution and supply of food and what we want to eat. Whenever government does reopen, uh, it's, it's going to start impacting, you know, what you get in restaurants, what you're able to buy off the shelves. Donald Trump is fucking you over. I, I, honestly, I can't overemphasize this enough. I keep saying, I keep saying how fucked you are. And, uh, you, you know, I mean, this isn't even one man fucking you up the ass. You're being gangbanged. OK, you've, you've got his cock up your ass. You got Jared Kushner's in your mouth. You've got a vaginal opening. Uh, they've got a third person there for that. The EPA now. The Environmental Protection Agency pollution inspectors are not on the job. I know that for a fact. So toxic waste is being dumped everywhere. I've seen some examples of this a few times I've been out in San Francisco. I know. I've been going to parties. I've been avoiding looking at that shit. I know it's out there. I still instinctively, as someone who served... With the San Francisco Police Department, as a law enforcement officer, I can tell you, the correct term, by the way, being peace enforcement officer, I have to keep correcting myself on that. I can tell you, I look for things instinctively without even conscious thought. And I know the pollution inspectors have not been on the job. There's shit dumped everywhere. Uh, the IRS, the Internal Revenue Service, is not staffed to answer questions about changes from the new tax law brought into effect by the motherfucking Russell Filiak Republicans. So people can't take advantage of the new tax law, even though it's impacted. Now, uh, at, at any rate, uh, getting a question relayed to me from uh, Niall. Uh, I, I understand he likes himself to be called Niall. <laughs> I'm sorry, I find that um, Vaguely entertaining uh, in terms of the uh, corrections on uh, his name itself. He's asking about uh, something, but I, I, I really can't read the comment. It was entered into. It's not appearing in the in, in the text box. Uh, it can, I got a notification for it. Maybe maybe Paul sent that through private messages. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but uh, you know, I won't pay attention. Here we are uh, from Niall Parkinson. Uh, question regarding the parks. Ask him what he thinks of David Paul Politis and uh, Missing 411 regarding National Park and Missing Persons. Well, uh, <laughs> somebody out there is getting tired of secular damage to the economy and they want to go metaphysical on us and start talking paranormal. Uh, come on, Niall. Uh, you know, uh, people disappear. Yeah, I know. People are disappearing. Uh, the person who read all the books on that the person who actually stuck a wall map up on her wall and stuck all the pins on the wall map following the people disappearing is our correspondent, Holly Koditis Kiefer, the lady named after a yeast infection. Uh, here's a shout out to Holly, our correspondent, Monterey, California. Uh, the closest thing we got to the Presidio military base now that the Presidio was shut down by myself is, of course, uh, the Presidio of Monterey, where the Defense Language Institute is headquartered. And Holly Koditis Kiefer uh, needs to be brought on at some point in the future to talk about disappearances of kids in uh, conjunction with the Presidio Monterey and the satanic military base operations down there. In the interim, she followed that 411 disappearance uh, phenomena for years. I remember I actually, through Laura Lee Solomon, uh, had some conversations through her, mind you, never spoke to him directly, with the author of that series of books. Dumbass motherfucker wanted me to read his books before I ever brought him on. I will not come on your show unless you read all my books. I said, fine, send me a bunch of copies. He said, no, you got to buy them. I said, are you crazy? Have you looked online for your motherfucking out-of-print books? And they cost hundreds of dollars. I'm not going to spend half a thousand fucking bucks, four to five hundred dollars, getting all the books in your multi-volume series to read them before you come on. Go fuck yourself. Go disappear up in the fucking woods, up in the mountains up there. Go up there yourself. Anyhow, one of the stupidest things I remember, uh, Keith Call, uh, our dear friend, getting uh, Valshay for this, uh, when we were at that uh, stupid uh, Super Soldier Summit, uh, Mind Control Summit, organized by Lorian Ann Fenton, my former manager, uh, a keynote cunt, you know, she um, uh, basically uh, had all kinds of clowns show up at these conferences. One of them, Keith Call, was there, and he verified with 
this with myself on one of my past transmissions. There's an episode where he's on record, he's on bandwidth and on record, verifying everything I said about this. We had some motherfucker there with guns, rocket launchers, grenades, machine guns up in his hotel room. I'm not shitting you. He had he had this not just there up in his hotel room. He had photographed it all, put it on his computer, showed it to Keith, called myself. Oh my fucking god. He wanted to recruit people to go up to these mountaintops where people disappear. So Mal Ferguson's got his witch uh, to an extent. I'm going to go into a tangent here on this shit. He had, uh, um, no, uh, Parkinson, not Ferguson. Uh, apologies. Yeah, Parkinson, like the disease. <laughs> Anyhow. And uh, Nile, like where people contract it when they, uh, when they swim in it. Uh, at any rate, um, this dude had Asperger's syndrome. The guy with all the guns. Not, he's not just armed, mind you, with machine guns and grenades, ready to take us out. Uh, I took care of him in a manner that Keith Call can verify. Not going to go into it. What I did was highly illegal, of course, and involved some physical force. Uh, but uh, he otherwise would have tore that conference apart because the people who were supposed to tear it apart were, of course, the uh, poor couple whose name I forget consciously now. That's where the drugs help who I had to turn away, who showed up to kill everybody uh, that dressed up like the Joker and Harley Quinn. Uh, and uh, I, I did shows on them in the past. Um, I actually spent some weird-ass time with the private investigator, Ed Opperman, talking to his daughter, who at that time had to be like fucking 16, maybe 14 years old. Maybe she was 14 years old. And she was with another kid who was like maybe 11. Okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration. The kid was probably 12 or 13. And Ed Opperman had this like radio show where these kids, these underage kids, were like talking about this shit like uh, the, the, the couple that tore up Las Vegas. They, they shot up, uh, sh killed two cops in Vegas. Hey, Paul, look up who killed those two cops in Vegas. Uh, down in Las Vegas, Nevada, that 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 year, uh, 2017 was it? And uh, anyhow, they were going to tear up the Super Soldier Summit originally, and I turned them away because I had the keys to their programming in terms of their uh, mind control program that they had gone through, which of course I had learned when I was working with Aquino. So I sent them in the other direction. Unfortunately, they wound up killing people anyway. They wound up killing at least two cops and then each other. Um, they may not even have killed the cops, to tell you the truth, uh, because that situation is so suspect. But uh, I was talking with them to these young kids uh, because of Ed Opperman at one point in time. Somehow I got talked into doing that on bandwidth and on record. So that's out there. That's floating around probably on the Opperman channel someplace on Spreaker. Uh, at any rate, um, the, um, the hills and people disappearing on, on top of these hill cops. Thanks, Paul. Uh this Asperger syndrome dude with all the firearms was trying to recruit people to go up into the hills with him to find out what's causing all these disappearances, which I can tell you right off. It's the um, non-human relic population that all the hoi polloi called Bigfoot. Uh, I hate the term Sasquatch because that's not a real Native American term. Sasquatch is like a bastardized term that uh, combines different Indian terms, Native American terms, into Sasquatch. There are actual Native American words that I forget. Uh, I'll have to ask Jerry Small, maybe. Shout out to her, dear lady. And uh, But uh, any true Native American speaker out there, um, give me a real Native American name for Bigfoot, and I'll start trying to educate people on trying to popularize that. Uh, but um, they are not people you want to meet. They, these relic populations of, uh, of, of primatoid human beings, uh, it, let's be real here, subhuman primates, they're horrible people. <laughs> They'll kill you in a heartbeat. And they are cannibalistic. They will eat you. Well, since they're a different species, it's not necessarily cannibalism. But uh, it uh, borders close enough on it, like when you're eating a monkey, where you'll catch all the same diseases uh, or have a higher chance of catching those diseases of uh, prions as if you were eating a human being. Uh, hell, you get, you're in danger of eating, catching prions from eating brains of cows. So um, at any rate, 
anyhow, they'll kill you and eat you. Uh, never have any doubts of that. Uh, anybody who goes out there and propagandizes these beings by all these friendly movies and shit. By the way, I'm not trying to promote genocide of this relic population of species. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's not something that's going to happen anyway, because they are highly intelligent. Uh, they're far more cunning than man. Hell, fucking rats are more cunning than man. They put rats through various tests and humans through the same tests as rats, and the rats win out every time. Uh, rats are a far more survival-oriented species than human beings, so they operate in the present moment at a very cunning level. Uh, these uh, subspecies of human primates are, uh, for all intents and purposes, they may as well be psychic. They're that attuned to their immediate environment. Okay, I've been given some links uh, by Pavel Edward Provara and the Las Vegas couple who shot to death too. Yeah, Jared the Millers. Thank you. Couldn't get that without you. Gerard Miller. Gerard Miller. I'm remembering the name. Trying to remember the girl's name now. Yes, you got it. You found it. Hugs, dear brother. You did well. Amanda. Amanda was her name. Amanda Miller. Gerard and Amanda Miller. That was who showed up uh, to kill everybody at the Super Soldier Summit. And uh, she uh, uh, basically, they were through a mind control program that I recognized instantly. Uh, they were off the mass production assembly line of murderous uh, Super Soldiers produced by Michael Aquino. I had the key words which to turn them off and away, which I employed. And uh, and then they went out and killed each other. They offed each other, which is part of the risk that when you turn them off, when somebody like that's been assigned to conduct a mass murder, then they usually kill themselves. Uh, but, it, well, you know, you've got a choice between that and uh, being put into physical danger yourself. I obviously turned them against each other. I'm pretty certain the cops were killed by somebody else. And they pinned that on Gerard and Mandy. The only people they killed were themselves. We know for a fact. The third person killed where they killed themselves on site, this nickel and dime store, was not killed by them. We know for a fact that that individual was shot by the LVPD, the Las Vegas Police Department, because the motherfucking idiot was a concealed carry cultist. And he had a fucking concealed carry gun that he pulled out and was waving around. So when the cops came in, they shot his ass. This is one situation in which I congratulate the cops. <laughs> Good for them. Then they made him a hero. Said what a hero he was. And uh, gave him this big public funeral. And everybody said, oh, what a hero. I mean, this, this guy was just an idiot, white trash piece of shit, concealed carry, who uh, a, you know, three others were killed. What 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 three others? It was just the cops and the, the, the dude and Amanda and Gerard. Is there something I don't know about? That's how I remember it. Unless, like, something happened that... Uh, Headline says, fuck, I mean, what, well, that's not how I remember it. At any rate, um, it, you know, um, that aside, uh, because anyone can look this up themselves. You know, if other people were killed, you know, everybody's free to provide me names. Uh, and uh, it, as because I remember Gerard, because uh, this was on film, it was on the security camera. Gerard and Mandy Miller went inside the little store and they told everybody to leave. They told everybody to leave because the, the key phrase I gave them triggered them specifically to suppress the killing urges in any mass murderous sense. So if anyone was shot, it was shot by the idiot with a concealed carry gun. I can guarantee you that, which is why the cops shot him when they walked in, then turned him into a hero posthumously saying that he, uh, you know, was uh, just another victim of Gerard and Mandy. But we know that wasn't the case. Uh, it's been conclusively proven at this point uh, that he was killed by the LVPD. Now, um, all that side. Uh, so this idiot who had all these weapons was trying to recruit people to go up into the mountains to uh, find out why people disappeared. And at that time, I was on antidepressants and uh, wasn't looking good, wasn't feeling good. It was all bloated. It was a quarter of 100 pounds overweight, all of it water weight that I couldn't get rid of because the uh, all the worst photographs of myself were taken at that time. And I looked like shit and I looked 50 years older. Uh, all of that. Uh, was impacting myself and then this guy with asperger's syndrome says yeah i'd never bring a person like you up with me into a situation like that because all you people on antidepressants are known to get violent you would just take my guns and you know go on a rampage and uh you, you would be a physical danger to myself so i would never allow you to go up into the hills with me to uh you know get to the bottom of these disappearances i was just thinking to myself what the f 
Why would I want <laughs> to go up to the top of these stupid hills and confront a relic population of violet primatoid humanoids? I, I, I wouldn't want to go up there with you. I mean, it, it's like, good God, like, it's, it's like somebody telling me, yeah, I wouldn't let you dive into the sewer like uh, myself because, you know, I'm a sewer diver and I dive into cesspits uh, for a living to uh, find out the chemical composition of all the shit and piss and toxic waste that goes into these various uh, cisterns and shit. You know, but I wouldn't let you dive in there with me because I, I don't think you'd be responsible enough to zip up the suit properly and you'd get toxic poisoning and shit, you know, and I'd, I'd say, okay, yeah, well, have at it, you know, I, you know, no, I, I wouldn't want to dive into the topics, into the sister, and it's, it's like that, it's like, what the fuck is on people's minds? Like, uh, anyhow, that's the, that's the closest I'll get for Niall Parkinson to talking about this shit. That's, that's, that's how personal it comes to me. For the disappearances of these uh, of, of these people up in these uh, mountain areas, you know. And here, here's my here's my answer to that, in general. Don't go up there. <laughs> Why do people go up there? I mean, after a while, this this Darwinian selection here. Really? I mean, you know, hey, there's people see primatoids up in the woods, you know, and people disappear up in the woods. I think that's kind of like two and two together. There's a logical solution. Don't go up there. But but people keep going up there. Okay, it's like after a while, well, all right. It's it's on you. You know, and uh so then some idiot with Asperger's wants to go up there with rocket launchers and grenades and shit, you know, have at it. You know, it, uh, honestly, uh, I'll put my money on the primatoids uh anytime. Anytime. It's like uh it's like the trailer for the uh y- you know, all the Bigfoot movies that portray Bigfoot in the most violent sense, those are the ones that hit, those are the ones that are accurate. <laughs> those are the ones that are accurate. The ones where he's like talking to you and he's like your friend, Harry and the Hendersons, okay? Yeah, ooh, that's all shit. Don't pay attention to it. Yeah, don't don't go friend in Bigfoot. He's not, he's not your friend. Just, just stay away from him, all right? It's like stay out of those neighborhoods. It's like, you know, when you go through those certain neighborhoods and you just are driving through and you say, I'm just too white. I'm just too white. It's like that. It's like that. And uh, so, you know, there's maps. There's like, you know, I, I mean, you know, when you're there, it, you're, that there's no one else around and no one can hear you scream. Don't go there. All right. Enough of that. The <laughs> I'm sorry. The drugs are still in effect. That's fine. All right. The lack of sleep drugs uh don't do this at home kids okay don't do as i do all right uh just as i say um that girl uh uh, amber rose dio you know she's classic textbook example of why you shouldn't play with the occult yes i'm a classic textbook example you know don't do drugs all right i've got nanoplasma going through me if i were a normal human being uh, I can tell you factually, I'd probably be hospitalized right now. So, um, I, fuck, I lived through a fentanyl overdose. Uh, that, this was, uh, last year, year before, maybe, uh, my son dropped by. He said, here's all that shit going around, uh, at the parties. Don't take this shit. I want you to know what it looks like. He put two of those pills in my hand and I popped them. <laughs> then I read later, cops had died. I got really sick. Right. Uh, but I survived. Uh, but uh, I didn't go to the hospital, but I survived. Uh, a bunch of cops, of course, were hospitalized with just a little bit of that shit. Uh, um, sifting it epidermally, absorbing it epidermally through their fingers, through the skin of their fingers while they were searching suspects. And they they almost died. Uh, OK, you you haven't uh, you haven't been subject to massive government experimentation. Don't do this shit. All right. Let's get back to um, how your life is impacted by um, government shutdown. The Trump administration has promised that tax refunds will be mailed on time. Uh, As far as I understand, they haven't delayed the tax filing day because uh, they're going to call back workers from furlough for that. So they're still going to tax you. See, this is the beauty of it. You may not get any benefits, but they're sure as hell going to take their taxes while the government is shut down under Trump. Under Trump. He's the guy doing this. You know, Mr. Uh, he puts the black mask on his head, goes around the neighborhood with a gun in his hand and collects uh, collects all this shit for the very government he says he's shutting down. Um, 
Now, the office responsible for issuing marriage licenses in Washington District of Columbia was closed. I know this because there were some same-sex couples in San Francisco that I met at parties that were talking about this to me. Uh, the city council passed an emergency bill to reopen it, though, from what they told me. Uh, and uh, the District of Columbia businesses are giving federal employees discounts. I know that much, too. Uh, there's free bagels from a bakery across from the closed National Zoo from that same-sex couple who was over there in Washington District of Columbia recently told me about this. And bottomless mimosas and Bloody Marys for $15 every day at a restaurant in area. Uh, the shutdown-themed drinks are being served at Capitol Hill bars. Uh, so this is all part of the shutdown theme. Um, now, I know also the federal government itself mispaying its $5 million dollar water bill to the district of columbia so the federal uh, government hasn't even paid the district of columbia for the water that it drinks and uh the fcc the federal communications commission has stopped most of its operations including its consumer complaint center so that's cool uh now i can really start swearing uh the um now i've always said before the only branch of military service worth a fucking damn the one my dad hated because, of course, he was a sailor for the Navy, was the Coast Guard. Uh, my dad always called them shallow water sailors. Took years of uh, exposing him to records from the Presidio military base, which had a Coast Guard base on site, the Presidio military base. And we also have a Coast Guard base in San Francisco that ultimately took both my mother and my father in for some things we had to do for mom that couldn't be done outside of the naval dispensary, the, excuse me, the medical dispensary at the local Coast Guard Island while I was processing her onto uh, the civilian insurance, which I had to get my dad on because it all goes through the husband. The woman couldn't get on the civilian insurance without getting my dad on it, and they wouldn't divorce, which she, if he, he divorced her, that she would have gotten on it alone. But in order to get her on Medi-Cal and Medi-Cal, I had to get him on Medi-Cal and Medicare and Medi-Cal. So I had to get them both on to get her on. And uh, during that period of time when we weren't on any of that and I was totally out of money, I uh, took them to the Coast Guard station. My friend Beaver drove us there, my gang brother. And uh, so the Coast Guard's the only service worth a damn. That and plenty I showed to my dad on record about Coast Guardsmen serving during the Vietnam War uh, in the river estuaries, just as he did as a gunboat patrol sailor back in the days he was in China finally built up a respect for the Coast Guard in my late and sainted sire, uh, who had the Navy sense of elitism, superiority, and snobbishness uh, towards Coast Guardsmen that uh, uh, high seas fleetsmen do. Uh, so the Coast Guard, about 41,000 active duty Coast Guardsmen are working without pay, and uh, they're unsure when they'll see their next paychecks. Uh, and they were actually told if you can believe this shit, that they should consider having garage sales and declaring bankruptcy. This is your Coast Guard. This is a branch of the motherfucking military service is being told they should have garage sales and if worse comes to worse, declare bankruptcy because they're not getting paid. This is 41,000 duty, active duty personnel on service to your republic in a military function are being told this. This is your Mr. Military President. This is Donald Trump. If you still defend this man at this point and you're in the military, you must be the dumbest son of a bitch or the dumbest cunt that ever polluted our gene pool. It's time for all you people to die. Fuck the Muslim threat. Fuck the Muslim. There is no Muslim threat. It's the Republican threat. It's the goddamn Republicans, not the motherfucking Muslims. They're fucking your day up. Every day. We got over 60 members of Congress rejecting their pay during the shutdown, with some choosing to donate their paychecks. Every single one of them is a Democrat. Every single one is a Democrat. The Russian collaborationist Republicans are keeping all their money. Fuck you. Fuck you, Republicans. Oh, and yet Vice President Mike Pence and his Republican cabinet secretaries have gotten a pay raise. They get a pay raise. That should be frozen. Now, not spending money. This is what they'll argue. You know what their defense is? 
They'll tell you that not spending money actually costs the government money and interest. The ultimate back pay it'll give without getting work in exchange. Uncollected fees and more. So that's why Mike Pence and his cabinet secretaries get a pay raise. They say, oh, you know, you know, if we, if we do the, we buy the back pay bit. It's just going to, with interest and everything, it's just going to be more expensive to you. So we got to give ourselves the pay raise. But nobody else is getting that shit. So you're costing the government money in everybody else's back pay. And you're getting work for no pay. But then when you get back pay, then you've got the interest. And then you've got the uncollected fees that have been going on all the while. It's just, it's madness. This is all in service of motherfucking Russia. And here, in my golden state of California, when I think about the wildfire prep work and firefighter training that we need to fight our fires started by motherfucking Republicans as part of the Russian insurgency, all that wildfire prep work and firefighter training has been halted as several thousand United States Forest Service workers and Smokey the Bear are furloughed. Because the majority of forested land in my golden state my state nation of California is federal land. So when we get the massive forest fires, that's all federal land. That's why I was shitting all over Trump when he was saying, oh, it's poor management. Well, it's his management. It's his management. It's his land. He's the administrator for our federal government. The overwhelming majority of forested land in California is federal land. And he was saying it was bad management led to the forest fires. Well, that's his management. That he's saying is bad. He said, it's my management that led to the forest fires. Well, now that he's got the shutdown, we can't even prepare for the fires. And the firefighters are on furlough. So if we get another series of wildfires, we are well and truly fucked. Uh, reminds me of the National Transportation Safety Board investigations of fatal accidents has been put on fold. President Donald Trump... He gave some advice to landlords of federal workers who can't pay rent. He said, I would encourage them to be nice and easy. Not like Donald Trump. If he was your landlord, you'd be out in your ass. So I think most people are going to follow his example. You know, fuck you, Donald. This is it. This is your president. He's not paying the federal workers. They got landlords and Donald Trump saying, oh, God, you're a landlord of a federal worker. Just go easy. Yeah, right. Oh, they're going to listen to you. Yeah, that's that's. Yeah, I'd put my. Put my faith in that. The uh, the this reminds me of mortgages. The two hundred and forty nine million United States dollars in monthly mortgage payments that Zillow estimates unpaid federal workers make could be in jeopardy of not going to banks. Again, uh, the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, federal loans on hold for people in rural areas. That's all the idiots who voted for Trump. <laughs> Well, in this case, they deserve it. Uh, well, we've got no new Freedom of Information Act requests in certain agencies. Oh, there you go with that. So this FOIA bullshit, the majority of it is total fucking bullshit. You know, the uh, FOIA, Freedom of Information Act. All of the requests have shut down. Uh, so there you go with that. They can't be processed. They're worthless anyway. Banks and credit unions catering to federal workers have offered assistance like no interest payroll loans. I mean, you know, that's touching. This is kind. This is humanitarian. None of this is necessary. People shouldn't need to be doing this. And this is the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, so what else comes to my mind? I know that I saw one case. A Julie Burr. I remembered her name because it was spelled like Raymond Burr, the old actor who none of you kids remember. B-U-R-R. -R. A federal contract worker in Kansas City, Missouri, set up a GoFundMe account to help pay rent. You know, stand in line. <laughs> they, um, oh, my God. Uh, what else comes to my mind as a former federal employee myself? Federal workers around the country have taken part in rallies against the shutdown. I know that. So we've led to federal workers protesting. Uh, universities are claiming that the shutdown is affecting families' ability to verify their income through the Internal Revenue Service, which makes it harder for them to secure federal loans. 
Uh, the IRS is simply denying the claims. So um, people aren't getting their education uh, expedited. The Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, has stopped reviewing and approving filings for initial public offerings. I saw that when I saw a headline from the Wall Street Journal. Now, almost all civil cases in federal courts, including discrimination and whistleblower cases, have been delayed. Uh, I know that as a former whistleblower myself. And uh, I know that there's a lawsuit that claims Trump violated the emoluments clause with his Trump International Hotel in Washington. That's been placed on hold indefinitely. So Trump is using this to his personal advantage. This is probably also one of the factors in his maintaining the shutdown, as he said, for years. He says he wants us to go on for years. We're not going to survive as a nation, of course. Mm. We're going to go into civil war. Civil war will result from this. Uh, and if it doesn't result from it immediately, if they're able to end the shutdown, it will result from it in the long term. The repercussions of this and everything he does are just, it, it, it's going to take war to set things right. Civil war here and then national war against motherfucking Russia. I mean, bring the Russians down. Fuck them. I mean, at this point, uh, when it comes to Russophobia for the duration of the war, this is an area where race hatred needs to be mobilized. Now, um, I know FBI agents will be working without pay. As a matter of fact, I know they started working without pay January 11th. The FBI Agents Association says the shutdown is going to hamper recruiting efforts. Uh, all of this is so that they won't be investigating the Russia investigation. That's what Trump hopes. So he's going to keep this shut down until his... It's time for him to rerun for president. Now, by that time, of course, there's not going to be a government. Uh, the United States itself, as a nation, in case you don't know it, risks losing its AAA credit rating if the shutdown drags on. That's according to Fitch ratings. <laughs> Just so you know. Uh, new research projects at United States universities funded by agencies like the National Science Foundation, they're going to be delayed if the shutdown persists. The FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, has stopped selling or renewing flood insurance, but it's quickly directed employees back to work after an outcry because of everybody who's uh, been impacted by floods all over the United States. Some states are more affected than others in terms of their concentration of federal workers. So um, all of this is um, highly imbalanced, just like our uh, electoral colleges. We've got several FTCs, or Federal Trade Commission services, that have been paused, including the Consumer Identity Theft Reporting System. As a former criminal psychology major, uh, criminologist, so to speak, I can tell you that came to my attention. I noticed that. Um, I did see, while I was uh, cruising through headlines, some personal stories that were just heartbreaking. Um, the um, One of them was Lila Johnson, uh, a federal contract employee who works as a janitor who can't pay her bills. Uh, that struck me as particularly a poignant personal story. And, of course, I contrasted that in my mind automatically, reflexively, to the Department of Defense, which I worked for and which made my reputation. The Pentagon itself isn't uh, affected, but defense contractors who do business with multiple agencies are. Uh, I note executives for two contractors told Defense One uh, the shutdown is costing them $10 million United States dollars per week in payroll for workers who have been idled. And the government is self is tens of millions of United States dollars behind in payments. Again, what Trump's doing to the economy is beyond criminal. He needs to go to prison for this. Uh, he, he needs to be exiled. His citizenship needs to be stripped. <laughs> and he needs to be deported where with all the Republicans, as I said, uh, other than those living in Dixie, take the rest of them, deport them to greater Manchuria. Uh, where, of course, they can worship Trump as their Buddha, uh, as their version of Kim Jong-suk. And uh, they, they will actually, at that point, border North Korea, and they can hire North Korea as their Mexican labor. Uh, North Koreans as their Mexican labor force. 
Now, scientists have had to cease their work for various federal research agencies, including NASA and the National Science Foundation. This places the results of delicate experiments in the balance. The federal agencies that aren't funded are, they're all more susceptible to cyber attacks because cybersecurity is oft augmented by contractors. So from a military defense security perspective, if you've ever seen that stupid commercial where you see the bullshit artists uh, trying to sell that company, thankfully I don't remember its name, so I'm not promoting them, that says it's not security or it's more than just security, it's defense. Well, there you go. Trump's just fucked your defense. Uh, all these federal agencies aren't funded. They're more susceptible to cyber attacks because their cybersecurity is augmented by private contractors who they can't afford to employ. And now, of course, the Russians are hacking everything. This is how Trump plans to become president again, because the Russians will, at this point, hack into all your systems, shut down all investigations into Russia, and make him president a second time without you even going to the voting booth. Um, federal court offices operating with fees and other reserve funds are going to run out of money within 48 hours. As a former federal employee, I can calculate that much knowing what I know. Within 48 hours, all the federal court offices operating with fees and other reserve funds are going to run out of money. By the way, the calculations weren't done in my head. This was actually done by the National Law Journal. Due property. Now, people missing immigration court dates because of the shutdown are being given new dates, which when I looked at them, I was rolling my ass on the floor and laughing. The dates that they've been given are years from now. Years from now. That's how backed up the government is. People who are missing immigration court dates because of the shutdown are told, well, come back in court in 2024, 2025. This is your immigration president. I mean, he's just given everybody. This is better than this is better than signing off on the dreamers. <laughs> Nobody can go home now. They can't even make them go home. Not to mention the border patrol not being paid and they can't stop from coming in. Uh, so uh, he's just opened the borders wide. Um. When it comes to traveling around within those borders, it comes to my mind, the U.S. mass transit systems have temporarily lost financial aid that supports a wide range of needs, from daily maintenance and service to ongoing repair and expansion process, projects. Um, now, you know how I learned about that? That was a report that was brought to my attention from the credit ratings agency at Moody's. Because I was talking to my surrogate son about my credit and making fun of the government, missing its water bill. And, of course, his sugar daddy does some really big credit shopping at Moody's. And so the report that he had available on the credit ratings agency, Moody's, which is what he uses to, you know, check on his own credit so he can do the shopping, you know, and, and he, he does constant consultation with him was that the American mass transit systems have uh, lost their financial aid that supports just any number of these uh, daily maintenance service, uh, ongoing repair and expansion projects. So that brings to my mind as well, more personal transportation like taxis, uh, which it's impossible to get around in San Francisco without, as it is in New York City. And I know that taxi cab and ride sharing Sharing drivers in Washington, District of Columbia, have reported less than average ridership as a result of there being fewer federal employees and tourists in the city during the shutdown. So uh, I learned that from cab drivers while I was going around the city during uh, the recent uh, uh, Byzantine Orthodox holidays. Now, um, to show you just how the world economy is impacted, Trump canceled his planned trip to the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Of course, nobody missed him. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jerry Small, a shout out to her, a hug and a kiss. She told me that probably they sent him a, uh, a personal communique asking him not to come. 
Uh, now, the Department of Justice is asking a judge to put on hold a lawsuit brought by three senators who are challenging President Donald Trump's appointment of acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker. So, again, this fits into his plans. Uh, all of this prevents um, our being able to check him legally in so much of his criminal acts. The Miami airport has closed one concourse for days due to TSA agents calling in sick in protest. Uh, so you can't even have your airport security. Um, if anyone does take down an airliner, you can blame Donald Trump. The Bureau of Land Management found reserve funds to open an Alaska office to hold public meetings on an agency plan that would make Arctic land available for oil and gas leasing purchases. Now, think about that. Somehow... The American Bureau of Land Management has found reserve funds to open an Alaska office to hold public meetings on an agency plan to make Arctic land available for oil and gas leasing purchases amid this federal shutdown. That's incredible to me. It's because Donald Trump is a, as Zoe Brendan says, laissez-faire man. This, by the way, was given to me by Zoe Brendan. Shout out to Zoe Brendan Hugs. He said that... Uh, that basically this is all uh, by eliminating the state. Trump is returning us to robber baron capitalism. Laissez faire. Excellent observation. And so we're getting this shit. This is what's going strong now. JP Morgan lowered its gross domestic product estimate to 2% from 2.25% for the first quarter, primarily citing the shutdown. So this isn't all beneficial to big business, mind you. It's only beneficial to the uh, rapists of nature, the nature rapists. Uh, mm. Close down the national parks, open up the field for oil and natural gas exploitation. Notice the pattern. Now, some diversions for furloughed federal workers has uh, led to interesting situations like George Mason University giving free basketball tickets. A zoo in Oregon offering free admission. Um, so I, I guess what they're trying to do is keep these people from going postal or something and uh, conducting mass shootings <laughs> by giving them bleed off activities. Uh, so uh, you got to hand it. There's some teamwork going on out there uh, for all our physical safety. AT&T and other mobile prov providers, they're waiving late fees for the furloughed. Uh, so, again, uh, we shouldn't need to be doing this uh, as, as, uh, as, as commendable as it is. Now, when I think about the um, zoos and shit uh, offering free admission for federal workers, it uh, brings to my mind our national parks. And in addition to sanitation problems, national park officials have said that people have destroyed Joshua trees at Joshua Tree National Park. Some reports have... Uh, have concluded that this was done by off-roaders to make room for their vehicles. So um, we've got uh, people uh, like uh, my former affiliate at Revolution Radio, um, Noreen Halpand, who love uh, Joshua Tree, talking about how it's being uh, essentially logged now by independent loggers. In other words, we've got um, Leatherface, uh, running around uh, with wearing his human skins out there, uh, just chainsawing down trees so he can park his trailers. Uh, and there's no one to protect these thousand-year-old trees because the government workers are all gone. I mean, this is, you know, eh, anyhow. A security checkpoint inside the George Bush Intercontinental Airport in Houston closed, I think it was last week. And I, I think it's remained closed as far as I know. Uh, due to staffing issues associated with partial shutdown of the federal government, Canadian air traffic controllers ordered hundreds of pizzas for their American counterparts who are working without pay. Um, so it's it, it, we got people helping us from other countries now who are feeding our government workers. I mean, this is this is pathetic. This is pathetic. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife brought some employees back from furlough to make some wildlife refuges accessible to hunters. This is drawing complaints that the government is trying to mute the effects of the shutdown. Um, uh, but, um, hey, if we don't let the hunters loose, you know, uh, then those deer are just going to breed out of all proportions and carry that Lyme's disease everywhere. 
Uh, so, um, yeah, believe me, you need to do that. I, I, I'm not being facetious. That Lyme's disease is just wretched. People's lives are destroyed by that biological weapon created on Plum Island off the coast of New York. And uh, all carried by the deer they originally had on Plum Island as their carriers for their uh, for the ticks. And they were brought back to the mainland and uh, we're all paying the price for it. You need hunters to just denude the deer population for that, if nothing else. Uh, we got unemployment claims by furloughed federal workers um, have skyrocketed over 400% in the last week of December, uh, which was the last time I checked. I remember that now. And so I don't know how bad it's gotten since then. Furloughed workers and mid-contractors are eligible for state unemployment, but those deemed essential and called back to work without pay are not. Just something I know as a federal worker, former federal worker. Now, while officials say that the SNAP program, Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, what we used to call food stamps, will be paid through February, they will also have to pay February benefits early by January 20th which is creating logistical and communications difficulties as they try to get 4.8 billion United States dollars in payments out to people who need them but don't know about the change. You know, we've got about 5 billion United States dollars that need to get out there. Uh, people are just totally unaware of what's going on who live off this stuff. See, I don't. Uh, my home-delivered meals are from a private program. Meals on Wheels is strictly voluntary. It gets money from personal donations. So I'm not living off the government in that regard. Um, and uh, I grandfathered into the program because it was absolutely necessary when I was caring for both my parents. And uh, I don't cook. So I got my parents pre-cooked meals that I reheated for them uh, that we lived off of. And uh, then uh, what happened otherwise was I grandfathered into it. And it uh, is my uh, baseline sustenance. Uh, but uh, filler food, really. Uh, some of it's Excellent, actually, comparatively speaking, but uh, obviously um, you can't really live off that. Um, you know, we were talking about Eastern Airlines. I do want to bring it to people's attention that um, when I spoke of May Man in Brussels, the haunting of Eastern Airlines, uh, we need to bring on at some point for at least a short while the Grand Madam Ramona Halitha Henry, who worked with airlines a good part of her life and personally knew for a fact people were afraid to work on Eastern Airlines. Um, so we'll have her relate some anecdotes about that in the near future. Uh, reminds me uh, that with the government shutdown now, Delta Chief Executive Officer Ed Bastian has said the shutdown has cost his company alone $25 million United States dollars because of a drop in the flights from government workers and contractors, and that it's delayed certification of new aircraft. Now, a number of reports produced by the government and used by businesses and investors have been delayed. I found that out by, uh, again, scanning before I started burning bandwidth. I saw that at Forbes. More than 40,000 immigration hearings have been canceled because of the partial government shutdown. Um, I found that out from Syracuse University's Transactional Records Access Clearinghouse, which tracks immigration court data. I know about such things because of my law enforcement background. And uh, so that shows you that we've got 40,000 immigration hearings canceled, all thanks to your immigration president. I mean, if, if you're anti-immigrant, how can you possibly support this son of a bitch? This guy's done more for illegals than anybody. More power to him. I mean, fuck it. I don't care. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration food admi inspectors are supposed to come back to work without pay to carry on food inspections that have been dormant since December 22nd, but no one's saying when they're coming back. Somebody just sent me an email about that because I've been talking about food inspections. The White House has said that economic impact of the shutdown will be far worse than has been so far suggested. We know that the shutdown will stall U.S. growth. This, this is all your business president. I'm the business president. I'm going to make America's economy great. Yeah, by crashing the fucking markets, stalling America. You know, fuck this guy. This is making America great. This is making America great. Really? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm coming towards the end of this. There's not much. I can't. I can't take much more of this. <laughs> so I'll go on to a different subject. Or, uh, but, but, you know. I've got to clarify what this has done to you. Uh, I had to spend an hour doing that. Back to the Coast Guard, now that I think of it. The Coast Guard, again, we have to remember, this is a branch 
this isn't a police force. This is a branch of the U.S. Armed Forces. And it just happens to be structured under the Department of Homeland Security. Think about the fact that they're the first and only branch to not pay service members because of a shutdown, because of their being under the Department of Homeland Security, because they enforce laws. They're a, milita- they're a branch of military service, the only one allowed to enforce laws, sans martial law. They're the only military service that can enforce law. So um, they happen to fall in that gray area where they got fucked up the ass and not paid, now that I think of it. Um, all right, there's only a few more things I could say, and I have to leave this topic. Otherwise, it'll drive us all to madness. The Federal Aviation Administration recalled safety inspectors who had been furloughed to instead work without pay, carry on safety inspections because they didn't want planes falling out of the sky. Okay, I feel safer now. Yeah, all right. The Internal Revenue Service officially ordered tens of thousands of employees back to work without pay to process tax returns because, you know, the government needs that money so it can pay for all these fuck-ups. I mean, uh, all right, that's the last on that. That's, okay, we've said enough. I mean, if you don't understand now the very real direct effects of a partial government shutdown, of a partial government shutdown, there's no hope to educate you. But hopefully now you appreciate my background as a federal employee and a Department of Defense research librarian at that. If at this point you believe my gang stalker, Stephen Alrim, that I never worked for the federal government, you're one dumb cunt or son of a bitch. Now, let's change the subject, top of the hour. And uh, I might start getting serious at some point. But uh, right now, let me get another drink of tea here. Try and oxygenate myself. Mm. There's a 2017 video of Trump and Putin in Germany that I finally found some context for. It was viral years ago, or last year, yesteryear. And it was Donald Trump trying to desperately get Vladimir Putin's attention at the G20 summit dinner. In 2017, MSNBC aired a video of various heads of state dining at the G20 summit in Hamburg, Germany. It was Trump's first big summit with the other world leaders, and it was also his first face-to-face encounter with Russian President Vladimir Putin that we know of. I saw GIFs, graphics interchange format uh, thingies that you see on the internet, that were created of the video because people got so gobsmacked or embarrassed by Donald Trump's childish, needy hand signals to the Russian president. Now, Trump was obviously desperate to get his attention. It took off on Twitter that day, yesteryear. But I actually finally really took a look at the clip, noticed German Chancellor Angela Merkel practically getting whiplash as she turned to see how Putin responded to Trump's signals. She takes a look, and then you see this kind of jump shot. It's, uh, anyhow, one of those things that is humorous. But as it turns out, Trump's eagerness to get Vlad's attention wasn't simply because he admired Putin. That very day of the dinner, July 7th, 2017, turns out to be the day that the New York Times contacted the White House for comment on a story they were about to break that Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, and Paul Manafort had had a secret meeting at Trump Tower in June of the year before yesteryear, 2016, with the Russian lawyer Natalia V. Veselnitskaya. Now, Veselnitskaya is a woman with known Kremlin ties who would later be indicted for obstruction of justice related to a Russian money laundering case she was involved in, not working on as an attorney, but actually involved in, evidently with the blessing and support of Vladimir Putin himself, with the Trump's Tower story that's being published by the New York Times these days, are breaking. It's time to take a fresh look at what transpired those 48 hours in Germany. Now, when I look back on the timeline yesteryear of the Trump Tower story, 
breaking in cover-up, that call from the New York Times must have set off some panic because Donald Trump's behavior started to get incredibly suspicious on 7-7-17, July 7th, 2017. He confiscated the interpreter's notes, instructed her not to brief anyone on the discussions with Vladimir Putin and Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Trump desperately sought Vladimir Putin's attention at the formal dinner, gesturing, you, me, together. At least that's what I think he was gesturing. I had to go to the primate school where they taught Coco how to talk. And I compared his sign language to hers. And I think that's what Coco says when she did the same motions. It came out as you, me, together. So that's apparently what Trump was saying. He, he went to the same school as Coco, apparently. Now, then Trump saw a private conversation with Putin. He didn't inform any of his own White House staff or national security advisors of the meeting. The following day, 7 8 17, July 8, 2017, just before the New York Times published the Tower story, Donald Trump personally dictated a statement as cover for Donald Trump Jr. That statement said the Trump Tower meeting was largely about the ban on Americans adopting Russian children, a ban Vladimir Putin put into place after the United States passed a law known as the Magnitsky Act which included heavy sanctions against motherfucking Russia, sanctions that were hurting Putin and his oligarchic mafia. Overturning these sanctions was a central issue for Vladimir Putin and key to his long-term political survival. Of course, that Russian adoption story would later be proven entirely false as Trump Jr.'s, if this is what you say it is, I love it, especially later in the summer emails, were published the following week on July 11th, 7 11, 2017. And those emails make it clear the Trump camp was expecting to get dirt, perhaps the stolen Democrat National Committee emails at the meeting. Now, also aboard Air Force One on July 8th, Trump called a New York Times reporter in an attempt to squash the story. Something the New York Times only revealed within the past 48 to 72 hours, which is what brought my attention to all of this. So the day after the two meetings, as Mr. Trump was on Air Force One taking off from Germany, heading back to Washington, he telephoned a Times reporter and argued that the Russians were falsely accused of election interference. While he insisted most of the conversation be off the record, he later repeated a few things in public in little-noticed asides. He said that he raised the election hacking three times and that Mr. Putin denied involvement. But he said Mr. Putin also told him, and this is a direct quote verbatim because I took notes, if we did, we wouldn't have gotten caught because we're professionals. That's what Vladimir Putin said. If we did, we wouldn't have gotten caught because we're professionals. Vlad said that. That's like, in your face, waving his dick in your face, telling you to open your mouth and swallow. And Mr. Trump responded, I thought that was a good point because they are some of the best in the world at hacking. Your president said, I thought that was a good point because they're some of the best in the world at hacking. I mean, in your fucking, up your ass and in your mouth, two dicks from either side, one's Vlad in your head, Trump's up your ass. Each one of them is... I wouldn't say six inches in. That gives them too much credit. Each one's at least three inches in, probably as deep as they can go. But they keep thrusting. Then Trump tried to sell a cover story that Russia couldn't be behind because, uh, you know, couldn't be behind the hacking because they never would have gotten caught. <laughs> oh, directly refuting the conclusion of 17 U.S. intelligence agencies who did catch them. Incredible, dangerous, derelict. Now, it's based on all this new context and Trump's suspicious behavior in the fatherland that it seems increasingly likely Donald Trump was seeking that private meeting using cocoa language to make certain he and Putin had their story straight before the New York Times bombshell went worldwide. Then we have to ask what was said.
Did Putin tell Trump to say the meeting was about adoption? Because on July 19th, 2017, only after news of Trump and Putin's secretive uh, second meeting was leaked, Trump told the New York Times he and Putin largely discussed Russian adoption. Now, did he and Putin concoct this cover story together? If that's the case, Vladimir Putin would have even more blackmail material on Donald Trump. That could explain the secrecy surrounding additional Trump-Putin meetings, especially the meeting in Helsinki, in which Trump insisted the only attendees would be himself, Vladimir Putin, and in one interpreter for each. We all saw the disastrous result of that meeting when Donald Trump held that jaw-dropping press conference rebuking U.S. intelligence services as he stood next to his handler, Vladimir Putin. Now, of course, one of my fangirls, Lena Shea, is absolutely right. You know, fuck blackmail. Trump being compromised and afraid of blackmail, of course it would explain that press conference and the many unusual policy decisions Trump has unleashed from the very beginning. Their decisions that have greatly benefited Vladimir Putin, every single one of them, everything he does, from easing sanctions to troop withdrawal in Syria. Hell, even Trump's trade war with communist China has benefited Vladimir Putin as the communist Chinese are increasingly turning to motherfucking Russia for soybeans and other agricultural goods. So, yeah, of course he does everything for Vlad. But as the fangirl Lena Shea has pointed out, that's not what keeps Trump under his thumb. At this point, Vladimir Putin has told him, we're going to kill you and your family if you don't do everything we say. It's at that point. They just simply told him, we're going to kill you if you don't do everything we say. And I agree. It is at that point. Fuck blackmail. Blackmail, blackmail is nothing compared to just out and out. Okay, we'll kill you. These are extraordinarily serious times. It's not just a test of our nation, our laws, and our republic. Vladimir Putin has been told by his man, Alexander Dugin, introduced to the world repeatedly by Temple of Set cultist Alex Jones as Vladimir Putin's brain. Alexander Dugin, a co-religionist, of Michael Aquino has told Vladimir Putin he is the Antichrist. And Vladimir Putin has accepted that role with enthusiasm. We are in the age of Antichrist. These are the end times of the world as we know it. What you do at this time or decide to do will decide the fate of your eternal soul. If your executive commander-in-chief, Donald Trump, is compromised by Vladimir Putin, the Antichrist, whether it be because of a video of Trump with prostitutes urinating on him in a Moscow hotel, shady related to corrupt real estate overtures to Vladimir Putin, or because of a web of lies spun by Donald Trump and his family around the 2016 meeting, or whether, as fangirl Lena Shea has said, which is the most credible. He's simply under threat of death. Your executive commander-in-chief is entirely unfit for office. This should not be a partisan issue. This is a national emergency, and both parties should act accordingly and remove this Russian asset named Donald Trump from the White House. And yet, Republican approval ratings concerning motherfucking Russia have never been higher. In the years between 2014 and 2018, that four-year period, equivalent to a college education when people should be learning something instead of losing something, Republican opinion polls on the motherfucking Russians as our friends have doubled in terms of positive response. Whereas before, in 2018, 20% of Republicans who were polled said the Russians were their friends from about 24% or a quarter of the Republican population. It's gone up to 44%. It's gone up to nearly half of Republicans say that they want Russia and America to become a single nation, a condominium, a condominium, a Russ American empire. That we should return Alaska to the Russians 
and have them directly bordering, for all intents and purposes, motherfucking California. This is your Russian insurgency. Forget your fantasy of the man in the high castle and being occupied by the Germans and the Japanese. You are divided as a culture and a nation between the Russians and the Satanists. And the only man identifying the fact that the Republican Party is not to be worked with. They are not to be dealt with in terms of any compromise. They are the enemy. They are an insurgency of a foreign power. If you have ever served in the military as I did, you took an oath to swear to defend the Republic of the United States as a constitutional entity from all enemies, foreign and domestic. You have the foreign enemy in Vladimir Putin who believes he is Antichrist and wishes to rule the world from a new capital in Jerusalem as relocated there by Donald Trump. And you have their domestic insurgency here in the United States, the white supremacist Republican Party. If you ever served in the military and took that oath, it's time to realize the Republicans are that enemy. If you don't realize that, you're not serving the oath you swore to upheld. And your primary enemy is Donald Trump, a Russian asset. All of these people need mass deportation. When I say that, it's not a fantasy. That is my sworn objective. Mass deportation of all Republicans outside of Dixieland. Take them. Deport them to Greater Manchuria. Any other whites not directly affiliated with Republicans, independent parties and the like, are just as much an enemy. They aided and abetted the Republican Party. Those that can prove that they're simply part of an honest white separatist movement can stay in the United States in a massive reservation in the Pacific Northwest for the white tribe of North America. The rest of America outside of Dixie and outside of Indian reservations will become part of a new race that will walk the earth. A hybridized mixed race heritage, new America, a single party state under democracy that will become the hope and light of the world, the next step in human evolution on the surface world. The pure Nordic Aryan race being in Unterland. We will have a cooperative evolutionary vanguard and initiative on the surface world here in North America. Now the men who fight that all of the Aquino cultists, the Republicans, the terrorist network, international terrorist network known as the National Rifle Association. The only way to back these fuckers up with full military force will be, of course, what President Trump has every intention of doing, declaring a state of national emergency with unlimited powers, an unlimited state of national emergency with infinite powers, from seizing control of the internet to declaring martial law, President Trump may legally do all kinds of extraordinary things you've never even thought of. Here, I turn back to my experience as a Department of Defense research librarian, and I can tell you things you never even fucking thought of. But of course, the Russians have done immense legal research on the domestic situation in the United States, and they are informing Donald Trump what he can do. In the weeks leading up to the 2018 midterm elections, that I was emphasizing so intensely, President Donald Trump reached deep into his arsenal to try to deliver votes to the Republicans. Most of his weapons were rhetorical. 
featuring a mix of lies and false inducements. Claims that every congressional Democrat had signed on to an open doors policy, an open borders bill. None had. His claims that liberals were fomenting violent mobs. Of course they weren't. His assertions that a 10% tax cut for the middle class would somehow pass while Congress was out of session. Of course it didn't. But a few of his assertions involved the aggressive use and threatened misuse of executive authority. He sent thousands of active duty soldiers to the southern border to terrorize a distant caravan of desperate Central American migrants going up north to evade the firearms violence generated by American manufactured firearms flowing in a river of iron and filling their streets with blood. And he announced plans to end the constitutional guarantee of birthright citizenship by executive order, which would instantaneously mean all African Americans, all black African Americans are foreigners on their own territory because making them citizens via Republican Party mandate on closure of proactive prosecution of hostilities in the American Civil War between the states was technically unconstitutional and illegal because it was railroaded through by a Supreme Court. So by packing the Supreme Court with his own reactionary pukes, Donald Trump is going to use his Supreme Court to render all blacks landless without citizenship. Sans citizenship, they instantly become illegal immigrants, which means all blacks can be deported back to Africa. If you think this is some kind of personal, shall we say, indulgence into fantasy on my part, I've gone in great detail as to the legality of what I say. Yes, it can happen. Yes, if you are black African, ultimately Trump can send you back to a home you never knew you had. And you're going to find out it's not home at all. But you already know that and you don't want to go there. There's no black African-American who wants to go live in Africa. But he'll send you there against your will. And Trump, during that midterm period, tweeted that law enforcement had been strongly notified to be on the lookout for illegal voting. All these measures failed to carry the day. And Trump concluded that they were too timid. So how much further will he go before 2020 when his own name is on the ballot? Sooner than that. When he's facing impeachment by a house under democratic control. Now, much more is at stake here than the outcome of one or even two elections. Trump has long signaled his disdain for the concepts of limited presidential power and democratic rule. During his 2016 campaign, he praised murderous dictators. He declared that his opponent, Hillary Clinton, would be in prison if he were president, goading crowds into frenzied chants of lock her up, lock her up, lock her up. He hinted that he might not accept any electoral loss. He would consider any electoral loss to prove the game was rigged. Of course, then they rigged the game on the Russian side so that he won. And now he's trying to tell everybody how he won by an actual majority when he lost by a majority so vast it's unprecedented in human history. That's true. That's a fact. Mm. Now, as democracies around the world slide into autocracy and nationalism and anti-democratic sentiment are on vivid display among segments of the white American populace. Trump's evident hostility to key elements of liberal democracy must never be dismissed as mere bluster. The moment this white trash piece of shit 
known as Donald Trump, declares a national emergency, a decision that be entirely within his discretion, he'd be able to set aside many of the legal limits of his authority. Now, I know all of you would like to think that America is protected from the worst excesses of Trump's impulses by its democratic laws and institutions. Finding false solace in the misconception that Trump can only do so much without bumping up against the limits set by the Constitution and Congress and enforced by the courts. Anyone of you ignoramuses who never worked for the goddamn government, or particularly the Department of Defense, would never know, functionally, you're under military junta as it is, ever since World War II. And that's why all of you are naive enough so that even when you do see Trump as a threat to democracy, you comfort yourselves with the belief that all the limits that I've just mentioned will hold them in check somehow. But they won't. Unknown to the majority of you Americans who didn't work for the military, especially the Department of Defense as a research librarian, I can tell you that there be a parallel legal regime that allows for your president to sidestep many of the constraints that normally apply. The moment the president declares a national emergency, again, this decision being entirely within his discretion, over 100 special provisions immediately become available to him. While many of these tee up reasonable responses to genuine emergencies, many, in effect, be dangerously suited to a leader bent on amassing and retaining power forever. To the day he dies and beyond, to institute a dynasty modeled on the North Korean regime in which his family becomes the Kim Jongs of the United States. A Kim Jong dynasty of the United States of the Kardashians, right, the Donald Trumps, the Jared Kushners, Donald Trump Jr., his family in power forevermore. For instance, if you wish, exemplary gratia. The president can, with the flick of his fucking pen, activate laws allowing him to shut down many kinds of electronic communications inside the United States or freeze Americans' bank accounts. Other powers be available even without a declaration of emergency, including laws that allow the president to deploy troops inside the borders of these United States to subdue domestic unrest. Now, this edifice of extraordinary powers has historically rested on the assumption that the president will act in the nation's best interest when using them. With a handful of noteworthy exceptions, this assumption has generally held up. But our president, a puppet of Vladimir Putin backed into a corner and facing electoral defeat and impeachment simultaneously. He will declare the state of emergency for the sake of holding on to power. So in this situation we are in now, our laws and institutions will not save us from executive power grab. That's what will take this republic down and in sight, inescapably and out of sheer necessity, civil war. In which case, the only leader you have who knows what the fuck he's doing and how to reconstruct a viable government is the son of Adolf Hitler on Russian Hill. Let's dismantle in terms of some analysis, this loaded weapon that's pointed at your fucking head right now and the heads of everyone you love in your family, all your friends, and if you're a person of color, what'll put you as a refugee on a boat back to Africa If you don't listen to the son of Adolf Hitler and get off your black ass and start supporting and sponsoring the man on Russian Hill. 
I can tell you as a former DOD research librarian, the premise underlying emergency powers be simple. The government's ordinary powers might be insufficient in a crisis, and amending the law to provide greater ones might be too slow and cumbersome. Emergency powers are meant to give the government a temporary boost until the emergency passes or there be time to change the law through normal legislative processes. Unlike the modern constitutions of many other nation states, which specify when and how a state of emergency may be declared and which rights may be suspended, the United States Constitution itself includes no comprehensive separate regime for emergencies. Those few powers it does contain for dealing with certain urgent threats, it assigns to Congress, not the president. For instance, it lets Congress suspend the writ of habeas corpus, that is, allow government officials to imprison people without judicial review. When in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it and provide for calling forth the militia to execute the laws of union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Nonetheless, the Constitution gives the president inherent emergency powers by making him commander-in-chief of the armed forces, as George Washington was, or by vesting in him a broad, undefined executive power, as George Washington held. Now, key points in American history. Presidents have cited inherent constitutional powers when taking drastic actions that were not authorized, or in some cases were explicitly prohibited by Congress. Now, notorious examples include, of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's internment of American citizens and residents of Japanese descent during World War II, and, to a far lesser extent, George W. Bush's programs of warrantless wiretapping and torture after the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Now, Abraham Lincoln conceded that his unilateral suspension of habeas corpus during the Civil War was constitutionally questionable, but defended it as necessary to preserve the Union. The Supreme Court has, unfortunately, all too oft upheld such actions or found ways to avoid reviewing them, at least while the crisis was in progress. Rulings such as Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer, in which the court invalidated President Harry S. Truman's bid to take over the steam mills during the Korean War, in which our steel production at the national level was not being geared towards total war mobilization in what was declared a limited conflict on the Korean Peninsula, but was simply an extension in the NITO, the Northeast Asian Theater of Operations. After, of course, Japan won the war, the Americans were left fighting it out on the Korean Peninsula, not with the Japanese, but with the communist Chinese. At that point, what happened was that uh, Harry S. Truman said, we've got to nationally mobilize our steel industry. This resulted in the court case, Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company versus Sawyer. And the court decided against their own executive commander in chief. And President Harry S. Truman was forbidden from nationalizing his steel mills for wartime production. As a result, the United States lost the Korean War. That was where the Supreme Court overruled the executive. That's the only case I consciously can remember or find evidence of. And while those exceptions have outlined important limiting principles, the outer boundary of the president's constitutional authority during emergencies has always remained entirely undefined. Because George Washington incepted a dictatorship for himself, he wanted to be king. He wanted that dynasty that will now be realized by Donald Trump. Now that's one thing that I would seriously consider would be, aside from a single-party rule in the United States of the Democratic Party, the outlawing of the Republican Party, as we have outlawed the Communist Party, because the Republican Party has proven itself a foreign, hostile insurgency, the one thing that I might do, in terms of considering advising the American population on, 
towards constructive reconstruction. After the Civil War, Trump is guaranteed to bring about, should he declare a state of emergency, would be the institution of a constitutional monarchy. By that, I would mean taking the descendants of George Washington and recognizing them as a constitutional monarchy with no secular power, but impact as a symbol of the nation. That would be enough to prove to the world that a nation that is based on actual democracy and a hybridization of its population into a new race to walk the earth of, aside from the Native Americans, a genuine American culture based on the interbreeding of all races north of the Mason-Dixon line, outside of New Africa, and a new confederacy comprising the white counties of the Solid South, and a white reservation along with super extended Indian reservations throughout the West, much of America will become a super megalopolitan belt of developed urban conurbations filled with people becoming increasingly intermarried to produce more people as myself. Much of this might be deemed a kind of genocide against the white population. For that reason, the reservation becomes so symbolically necessary and the potential for a constitutional monarchy in which the descendants of the founding fathers might be simply acknowledged as representative and symbolic of the constitutional republic on which the democracy has been founded as a single party state. And the reason I say this is because the overwhelming majority of the descendants of the founding fathers who were pure evil and absolute bastards, slave owners, plantation owners, scum of the earth, who have left us with this horrible situation that we're contending with now, the overwhelming majority of their descendants, on the other hand, are liberal progressives and the Northeast is solidly Democrat, with many of their descendants supporting the best in progressive ideology that has done its best to counter the Russian insurgency of the white trash Republicans. When I speak of white trash piece of shit, one may notice that no matter how much I've castigated the Founding Fathers, the one thing I've never compared them to is the low-class trash that brings forth human shit like Donald Trump. They were the nobility of their day. And if America's a, to ever develop a solid culture, an actual culture instead of an anti-culture, the recognition of a nobility in the United States would put it on par with the civilized nations of Europe and Asia and Africa who have their own kingdoms. That aside, when we turn back towards the emergency we're dealing with in the moment, I think back on presidents that can rely on a cornucopia of brawers provided by Congress, which has historically been the principal source of emergency authority for the executive branch. As a historian, I can tell you throughout the late 18th and 19th centuries, Congress passed laws to give the president additional leeway during military, economic, and labor crises. A more formalized approach evolved in the early 20th century when Congress legislated powers that would lie dormant until the president activated them by declaring a national emergency. These statutory authorities began to pile up. And because presidents had little incentive to terminate states of emergency once declared, these piled up too. By the 1970s, hundreds of statutory emergency powers and four clearly obsolete states of emergency were in effect. 
For instance, the national emergency that Truman declared in 1950 during the Korean conflict remained in place and was being used to help prosecute the war in Vietnam. Now, aiming to rein in this proliferation of dictatorial powers, Congress passed the National Emergencies Act in 1976 on the 200th constitutional anniversary of the American Republic. Under this law, the president still has complete discretion to issue an emergency declaration, but he must specify in the declaration which powers he intends to use issue public updates if he decides to invoke additional powers, and report to Congress on the government's emergency-related expenditures every six months. Now, the state of emergency expires after a year unless the president renews it, and the Senate and the House must meet every six months while the emergency is in effect to consider a vote on termination. By any objective measure, the National Emergency Powers Act of our National Bicentennial 1976, has utterly and completely, spectacularly failed. 30, count them, 30 motherfucking states of emergency be in effect today as I speak, which none of you know of, and yet I know of as a Department of Defense research librarian. 30 states of emergency in effect now. Several more, several times more, orders of magnitude more than were in effect when the National Emergency Act was passed back in that bicentennial of 1976 when I was but 10 years old. Now, most of these states of emergency have been renewed for years and years on end. And during the 40 fucking years the law has been in place, Congress has not met even once, not a single goddamn time, let alone every six months, to ever vote on whether to end any of these standing states of emergency. You are already, in effect, under martial law. This is why I keep saying we're under military junta. All the white trash pieces of shit out there and my idiotic gang stalkers who count on your ignorance continually state, I hate on the military, I rag on the military because I had a bad experience. What I'm presenting to you is reality. You are under rule of these motherfuckers. And they're getting paid. They are getting paid. Not only that, they're getting pay raises. Trump traveled to Iraq to congratulate the troops on their pay raise going on during his government shutdown. They're getting pay raises in government shutdown, just like Mike Pence. Only the branch of service worth a damn, the U.S. Coast Guard, the actual humanitarian service that does more than just kill people, that actually shuts down drug operations. Only they're getting no pay. That's how fucked up your military went to is. And here you are saying, let's go watch the man in the high castle and see how evil the Japs and the Nazis are. Oh, man. And in your sick, psychotic fantasy world, your pseudo-intellectual construct in which you won in World War II, you say, oh, thank God we won the war. The Japs and the Nazis be at power. Look at that shit. See them in uniform? Oh, those fascists, they're so evil. You're under administration by a bunch of treasonous men in uniform who should be taking out the Republican Party and shooting them. Shooting these Republican motherfuckers because they're the goddamn enemy and they want to kill you. But instead, they're serving Vladimir Putin. That's why we've got to deconstruct the military, send the officers, the commissioned officers into exile, permanent retirement in the Pacific, in the various Hawaiian and Oceanian islands like Guam, and establish a reinstated draft so we dismantle the mystique of the military, of which there should be none. 
that every man must serve, barring, of course, circumstances for religion, conscientious objection, physical deformity, etc., mental incapacity, psychosis. But aside from that, every man must serve because it's supposed to be a citizen soldiery. That's why we have a militia. Now, as a result of this unlimited executive authority, the total failure of Congress to in any way, shape, or form follow up on their responsibilities to enforce limitations on executive power, the president has access to emergency powers contained in 123 statutory provisions. Now, granted, that's not out of my memory from days at the Department of Defense. I actually confirmed that as recently calculated by the Brennan Center for Justice at New York University School of Law. Now, these laws address a broad range of matters, from military composition to agricultural exports to public contracts. For the most part, the president be free to use any of them. The National Emergencies Act doesn't require that the powers invoked relate to the nature of the emergency. Even if the crisis at hand is, say, a nationwide crop blight, the president may activate the law that allows the Secretary of Transportation to requisition any privately owned vessel at sea. Many other laws permit the executive branch to take extraordinary action under specified conditions, such as war and domestic upheaval, regardless of whether a national emergency has even been declared. The legal regime for emergencies as stands today and the ambiguous constitutional limits combined with a rich well of statutory emergency powers all provide the ingredients for an incredibly invasive encroachment on American civil liberties. And yet so far, even though presidents have oft advanced dubious claims of constitutional authority, Egregious abuses on the scale of the Japanese-American internment or the post-9-11 torture program have been rare, and most of the statutory powers available during a national emergency have never been used. But none of that guarantees what a Russian puppet president will do under pressure. Donald Trump has not shown the reticence of his predecessors. To borrow from Justice Robert Jackson's dissent in Korematsu versus United States, the 1944 Supreme Court decision that upheld the internment of Japanese Americans, each emergency power lies about like a loaded weapon, ready for the hand of any authority that can bring forward a plausible claim of an urgent need. That's what brings us to the internet kill switch. Like all emergency powers, the laws governing the conduct of war allow the president to engage in conduct that would be illegal during ordinary times. This conduct includes familiar incidents of war such as the killing or indefinite detention of enemy soldiers or enemy aliens as all Japanese instantly became when they were deprived of their citizenship. That's what all blacks will instantly become when Donald Trump overturns the Fourth Amendment. All black African Americans instantly become enemy aliens on American soil, meaning that they have to be interred for the safety of real Americans. That means Americans with citizenship. That means whites. And deported. But the president can also take a host of other actions, both abroad and within the United States. So from rendering black African Americans landless, and therefore of necessity, of imperative, to be first interred as prisoners of war, enemy aliens, and then deporting, you see, it starts to go downhill from there. <laughs> That's just the top. That's just where it begins. See, these laws vary dramatically in content and scope. Several of them authorize the president to make decisions about the size and composition of the armed forces that are usually left to Congress. 
Although such measures can offer needed flexibility at crucial moments, may be subject to misuse. For instance, George W. Bush leveraged the state of emergency after 9-11 to call hundreds of thousands of reservists and members of the National Guard into active duty in Iraq for a war that had nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks. Other powers are chilling under any circumstances. Take a moment to consider that during a declared war or national emergency, the president can unilaterally suspend the law that bars government testing of biological and chemical agents on unwilling human subjects. Indeed, human subjects do not even need to be informed. They're undergoing a biological or chemical agent of war test. That means that he can test with no repercussions chemical or biological agents of war on you your children all you any of your loved ones or friends your wife they don't need to volunteer they don't need to know since we're still legally in declared state of world war ii this is why the government's been able to abduct americans out of their beds and just let them think they got probed up the anus by aliens. The president, more openly, without any covert attempt to cover what he's doing, can take anyone you know and love, or yourself, and use you for weapons testing. Beyond that, it is within his right and dire to seize control of all United States internet traffic, impeding access to certain websites, and ensuring that internet searches return pro-Trump content as the top results 100% of the time. So that you'll live in motherfucking Russia or North Korea for all intents and purposes. If you live in Russia, communist China, or North Korea, and you look up on the net anything about Vladimir Putin, Kim Jong-suk, or the Communist Party, all that comes back is 100% positive results. Everybody loves me. Women think I'm sexy. That's all you're going to get about Donald Trump. I smell good. I'm really thin. Now, one power poses a singular threat to democracy in the digital era. In 1940 fucking two. 1942. I found out while going through Department of Defense documents, that Congress amended Section 706 of the Communications Act of 1934 to allow President Franklin Delano Roosevelt to shut down or take control of any facility or station for wire communication upon his proclamation that there exists a state or threat of war involving the United States. Resurrecting a similar power, Congress had briefly provided Woodrow Wilson during World War I. Now, at the time, wire communication meant telephone calls or telegrams. Given the relatively modest role that electronic communications played in most Americans' lives, the government's assertion of this power during World War II likely created inconvenience but not havoc. So no president has used it since because they never thought of it. But it's still in effect. Because we're still legally at war with the Thousand Year Reich in exile in Unterland and with my true homeland and heartland that represents the bastion of Hitlerism on the surface world, the Nationalist Republic of China is reestablished on the hundred islands of Isla Formosa, Taiwan. So I can tell you, as an enemy, per United Nations definition, a national of the Republic of China declared a criminal rogue state, the only extant on earth that represents the Axis powers today. This is why all of my personal communications are monitored because I'm a member of an enemy alliance. But that, of course, gives no legal right for the National Security Agency or Michael Aquino to abuse any of that and provide my personal communique to a schizo bitch like Rose Dio so that satanic cunt can do what she did and shut down 
all of my legislative videos only to be resurrected by our man in England, John Warrington the Magator. Make certain to subscribe to his channel. That goes with that saying. Provide him fiscal support where possible via his PayPal electronic address, John underscore war at hotmail.com. In order to prevent you from hearing me at all, Donald Trump will realize we're in a state of war and shut down your enemy transmissions from Douglas Dietrich in a heartbeat. If only it is advisors like Alex Jones had the balls to bring up the name of Douglas Dietrich. They don't because under direct instructions from Michael Aquino, Douglas Dietrich's name is never to be spoken aloud. He's the name that's feared more than God or Satan without any self-indulgence on my part, without any exaggeration or magnification of myself in my own mind. Do your damnedest to find Douglas Dietrich mentioned on any alternative media station, any source of information in alternative media, certainly in conventional media or alternative. Douglas Dietrich is impossible to find. They fear the naming of myself more than God or the devil himself in the world of the satanic pedopathocracy that brought you Donald Trump. So no one's told Donald Trump about Douglas Dietrich. He doesn't know I exist. But if he did, he would interpret that 1942 law to cover the internet and shut me down with his next breath. Because I know that the Donald Trump administration has recently endorsed the 1942 reading during debates about cybersecurity legislation. And under the Trump interpretation, Section 706 is to effectively function as a kill switch in the United States that will be made available to Donald Trump the moment he proclaims a mere threat such as his inability to build a wall as a national emergency and mobilizes your armed forces using their U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, their CB or their construction battalions for the United States Navy and all other combat operations forces involving engineers to build a wall using your tax dollars which Mexico will never pay for unless America conquers it in state of war. All of this brings on immediate clear and present danger of armed conflict. They can never declare a war legally because the Empire of Japan won World War II and forced the United States to forever renounce its ability to declare a state of war. But you see, if we have a civil war, and we reconstitute the United States, that Japanese imposition no longer applies. And we can finally declare war against Russia and take traitors like Alex Jones and execute them as the assets that they are of the enemy. Where we stand now, on the other hand, is where Donald Trump has the power, based on World War II's 1942 Communications Act, to assume control over all United States internet traffic. The potential impact of such a move can hardly be overstated, aside from its personal impact on myself in being cut off from any transmissions unto yourself via YouTube or anywhere else. 
In August of this year, in an early morning tweet, Trump lamented that search engines were rigged to serve up negative articles against him. He says he's going to flip that. This law is what he's referencing, boys and girls. The law you never knew about. Because later that same day, the administration said it was looking into regulating the big internet companies. Trump warned himself, and I quote him verbatim, I think that Google and Twitter and Facebook, they're really treading on very, very troubled territory, and they have to be careful. So if the government were to take control of the United States intranet infrastructure, Trump will accomplish directly what he threatens to do by regulation. Ensure that internet searches always return pro-Trump content as the top results. The government also would have the ability to impede domestic access to particular websites, including social media platforms. It could monitor emails, not just Douglas Dietrich's, which they're already doing, but it could monitor yours or prevent your emails from reaching their destination. It could exert control over computer systems, such as states' voter databases and physical devices such as Amazon's Echo speakers that are connected to the Internet. This would be their version of doing what Michael Aquino did when he hijacked the spirits of those who had died on Flight 411 or the daughter of a man in Brussels. Your own Echo speaker We'll start telling you, if you're a disturbed individual on the edge of suicide, your own echo speaker can be governmentally programmed to tell you to pick up that firearm and blow your brains out. Do it. Do it. Do it. Now, to be sure, the fact that the Internet in the United States is highly decentralized a function of a relatively open market for communications devices and services. That alone, in terms of infrastructural dispersion, offers some protection. Achieving the level of governmental control over Internet content that exists in places such as China, Russia, and Iran would likely be impossible in the United States. Moreover, if Trump were to attempt any degree of Internet takeover, an explosion of lawsuits will follow. Based on its First Amendment rulings in recent decades, the Supreme Court might seem unlikely to permit heavy-handed government control over Internet communication, but any complacency is a mistake, because that Supreme Court is now under Trump control. So all the lawsuits will go blazing down in a vainglorious crash, and Trump will get his total control. Over all companies, he'll be able to do what Truman couldn't do and mobilize the information companies the way Truman was not allowed to mobilize steel. And complete control of Internet content wouldn't even be necessary for Trump's purposes. Even with less comprehensive interventions, he could do a great deal to disrupt political discourse and hinder effective organized political opposition. And the Supreme Court's view of the First Amendment is not immutable. For much of this nation's history, the court was willing to tolerate significant encroachments on free speech during wartime. Geoffrey R. Stone, a constitutional law scholar at the University of Chicago, has written, The progress we have made is very fragile. It would not take much at all to upset the current understanding of the First Amendment. Indeed, all it would take is five Supreme Court justices whose commitment to presidential power exceeds their commitment to individual liberties. We have well beyond that. The Supreme Court is Trump's court now. And the First Amendment will be repealed. That's no loss. I've told you this before. We will work infinitely better without it. That's not the threat. The ability to communicate Being intercepted is the threat. But that brings my mind, in its free associative manner, to the sanctioning of Americans. We've talked about sanctions on motherfucking Russia. Mm. What most of you don't know is that Americans 
can also be sanctioned as individuals. Again, you kids don't know about this because you never worked for the Department of Defense and the military junta. So, as a former federal employee, aside from appreciating the ironies of even partial governmental shutdown, what I can tell you is that next to war powers, economic powers might sound benign, but they're among the president's most potent legal weapons. All but two of the emergency declarations in effect today were issued under the International Emergency Economic Powers Act, or IEEPA, the EPA, IEEPA, International Emergency Economic Powers Act, passed in 1977. The law allows the president to declare a national emergency to deal with any unusual and extraordinary threat to national security, foreign policy, or the economy that has its source in whole or substantial part outside the United States, meaning Trump's trade war with China. That's why he started it. Donald Trump, because of the trade war and the federal government shutdown, triggering national emergencies domestically and worldwide, he can now order a range of economic actions to address the threat, including freezing assets and blocking financial transactions in which any foreign nation or foreign national has an interest. In the late 1970s and 80s, presidents used the law primarily to impose sanctions against other nations, including Iran, Nicaragua, South Africa, Libya, and Panama. Then in 1983, when Congress failed to renew a law authorizing the Commerce Department to control certain exports, President Ronald Reagan declared a national emergency in order to assume that control under IEEPA. Subsequent presidents followed his example, transferring export control from Congress to the motherfucking White House, all under control of one man, an executive. President William Jefferson Clinton expanded IEEPA's usage by targeting not just foreign governments, but foreign political parties, terrorist organizations, and suspected narcotics traffickers. President George W. Bush then took matters a giant step further after 9-11. His executive order, 13-224, prohibited transactions not just with any suspected foreign terrorists, but with any foreigner or any United States citizen suspected of providing them with support. Once a person be designated under this order, no American can legally give him a job, rent him an apartment, provide him with medical services, or even sell him a loaf of bread unless the motherfucking federal government grants a license to allow that specific transaction. And the Patriot Act gave that order even more muscle, put it on steroids, allowing the government to trigger these consequences merely by opening an investigation into whether a person or group should be designated. So the moment you're even suspect and under investigation, this, all you idiots, who are waiting for the number of the beast to be stabbed upon your forehead. It's here and it don't need no goddamn micro circuit. You don't need no goddamn microchip implanted in you, you motherfucking idiots. All you ignorant goddamn bastards paying your taxes for this already have it. It's there. You're born with it. The moment you're under investigation, no one can hire you. They cannot give you a job. You cannot be provided shelter. No one can provide you medical treatment. You could be bleeding out on the street and the hospitals would have to say, sorry, and let you die. No one can feed you. Rather, they can't sell you food. So the only way you can eat is by beggary. Someone has to freely give you what is theirs. Now, designations under Executive Order 13.224 are opaque and impossible to challenge. You can't challenge them 
because the information is not provided on what grounds you're being investigated. So that means a total capris and whim. This can happen to you. Someone could just not like you. Maybe you turn someone down for sex. Maybe they don't like your race. Maybe they just don't like your face. And then your life's destroyed. This is why you see so many homeless people. And they don't know what happened. Wondering where it all went wrong. And if it's already like that, imagine what it's going to be like when Trump takes over. I don't mean... Where is that now? I mean, when he declares a state of emergency. The government, you see, needs only reasonable basis for believing that someone is involved with or supports terrorism in order to designate he or she. The target be generally given no advance notice and no hearing. He or she may request reconsideration and submit evidence on their own behalf, but the government faces no deadline to respond, and they never do. Moreover, the evidence against the target be typically classified, which means whomever you are, you're not allowed to see it. You can try to challenge the action in court, but your chances of success are absolutely impossible, As all judges defer to the government's assessment on basis of the government's own provided evidence. These are the witch hunts of the Inquisition, motherfuckers. All you little boys and girls out there who never worked in Douglas Dietrich land. Black ops and military junta, mind control programs. Where you don't get the secret keys to turn mass murderers around into blowing their own brains out. None of you get the passwords. None of you know reality. And only a few of you, like Douglas Dietrich, have ever, even occasionally, so far been caught up in this Kafkaesque system of smoke and mirrors. And most of you who have, have been people the rest of you white Americans haven't so far cared about. Several Muslim charities in the United States were designated or investigated based on the suspicion that their charitable contributions overseas benefited terrorists. Of course, if the government can show through judicial proceedings that observe due process and other constitutional rights that an American group or person is funding terrorist activity, it should be able to cut off those funds. But the government shut these charities down by freezing their assets without ever having to prove its charges in court. Now... In the case of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he abused this power to freeze all assets of all Japanese Americans and the Empire of Japan overseas. So all of the gold, all of the various uh, monies that Japan had in safe boxes or deposits or various accounts all over the world, but particularly anyone who had joined America, meaning all America's satellite nations like the British Empire and the French Republic, they all obeyed America's demands to freeze Japanese assets, and of course America froze all Japanese assets here. This, of course, is what bankrupted the Empire of Japan and forced it into war. Now, in other cases, on a more personal level, when you come back from World War II, my area of specialization, to just what's going on on the domestic scene today, or at least within recent history. I know of cases where Americans were significantly harmed by designations that later proved to be simple mistakes, sometimes even a misspelling. Can you imagine the horror? For instance, two months after 9-11, the Treasury Department designated Gerard Jama first name spelled G-A-R-A-D, surname spelled J-A-M-A, a a Somalian-born American, based on an erroneous determination that his money-wiring business was part of a terror financing network, Jama's office was shut down and his bank account frozen. News outlets described him as a terrorist. For months, Jama tried to gain a hearing with the government to establish his incident. His, His incidental impact by this, meaning... It was incidental to the government that he was slammed by an 18-wheeler truck. (laughs) Nothing incidental to him. This was his life and death. This is why, to a government worker, it's frog baseball. They go out there with a baseball bat, like uh, 
oh, Beavis and Butthead, and they smash frogs. But it's life and death of the frog. So, this guy's life was destroyed. This poor Somali bastard, he tried to establish his innocence by legal proceedings. And in the meantime, obtained the government's permission to get a job so he could pay his lawyer. Only after he filed a lawsuit did the government allow him to work as a grocery store cashier and pay his living expenses. It was several more months before the government reversed his designation and unfroze his assets. By that time, he lost his business and his family. And the stigma of having been publicly identified as a terrorist supporter continued to follow him to the point where even he and his estranged family faced death threats, bomb threats, and rape threats on a daily basis. Like he was Douglas Dietrich. Now, despite these dramatic examples, IWPA's limits have yet to even be fully tested. In other words, it's infinite. Its power is unlimited. After two courts ruled that the government's actions against American charities, these charities, were unconstitutional, Barack Obama's administration chose not to appeal the decisions and largely refrained from further controversial designations of American organizations and citizens. Uh, by not taking any action, they decided that that was the most conservative thing to do. Now, the only reason President Trump has followed that same approach so far. It's only because he doesn't know about it yet. And it's a good thing no one dares to tell him about Douglas Dietrich, or he'd actually be educated into some of what he could do. Of course, that's going to change, not because of me speaking to you right now. This will likely never reach the ears of Donald Trump. But other advisors in his company have been programming him the Russians have been doing an enormous amount of research and his handlers will feed it into his pea brain, that empty devoid space with a shriveled up walnut between his orange ears. I've already seen impacts of this in October last year. In the lead up to the midterm elections, Trump characterized the caravan of Central American migrants headed towards the United States border to seek asylum as a national emergency. Although he didn't issue an emergency proclamation, he could do so under IWEPA. He could determine that any American inside the United States who offers material support to the asylum seekers, or for that matter, to undocumented immigrants inside the United States, poses an unusual and extraordinary threat to national security and authorize the Treasury Department to take action against them, seize all of their assets, real estate or monetary, in account. You see, that's why the government shutdown has so impacted the benefit of so many illegals. Now the illegals are here to stay. We can't get rid of them. And therefore, anyone who now hires them or somehow helps them because they can't leave now, we, we can't process them for years. Trump can declare you to be cooperating with the enemy as if you were a traitor to your own branch of armed service on the field of battle in active operations. And you will never be hired again. You will never be able to buy or sell. You have the mark of the beast without any microchip. You are born with it because you're an American. This is why America is the Antichrist empire. Now trying to help the Antichrist out of Russia. Gog itself from the north clearing the way by pulling all troops out of Syria that they may march into Jerusalem and install with full cooperation from Bibi Netanyahu, who's under so many investigations that his only way to maintain power would be to have the Russians occupy and instate Vladimir Putin as Antichrist over the world in his capital of Jerusalem to maintain Bibi Netanyahu in power forever in Israel. This is the Antichrist order all of you dispensationalist evangelicals have been warning up forever, and yet you say Donald Trump be the king that God sent to earth to rule as your American dynasty. All the white evangelicals of the United States are the worst of Satanists. With your King James Bible and all of its deceptions that I've exposed, stick to your 
English translated Nuremberg Bible, burn your King James Bible, only then can you even have hope to redeem your soul from the flames of hell. And even now, after all I've already exposed, Americans might be surprised to learn just how readily the president can deploy troops inside the United States. Such a move would carry echoes of a law passed recently in Hungary, Mejarzag, by Viktor Orban. You see, the motherfuckers in Hungary, all you Magyars suck Russian dick. If you're a Hungarian, you're a piece of shit. You suck Russian ass. They got Viktor Orban running their country who took statues of Hungarian heroes who resisted Soviet invasion. And they've taken those statues down because Vladimir Putin said, hey, I don't like that. Those statues you got up are people who resisted our invasion. And so Viktor Orban took all statues down of Hungarian resistance to the Soviets. He is back to being a satellite state behind the Iron Curtain, as is Poland, as is the Czech Republic, as is Austria. All these shithole nations can only be liberated by German invasion in alliance with the Ukraine. Coming in from east and west, to create a maritime belt of satellite states to a new Reich that can lead civilization out of the Slavic night of Russian insurgency. So these motherfucking Hungarians, Viktor Orban, who visited Israel, a man who hates Jews and has identified George Soros who was born in Majarazag as a filthy fucking kike. Here's this guy who hates Jews, visited Israel, and Bibi Netanyahu said, Victor Orban is my man. The Israelis are out to kill you if you're Jewish. If you're a Jew in the diaspora, the Israelis want you dead, just like they did during the Holocaust, because they're filthy fucking Zionists. Certainly some Israelis are not like that. But just as we had a division, historically, that has remanifested yet again in the cases of Vietnam or Germany, Israel, too, must once again be divided as it was before King David united Israel and Judah. At that time, there was a north and south Israel. Israel in the north and Judah in the south. We need to return to that time. With a road between the two, a demilitarized zone for Palestinians to travel between the Gaza Strip and Palestine proper. With an international Jerusalem, not capital to anyone, and most specifically not the Russian Antichrist from Gog in the north. Only by this division into a northern Israel, with a coronated King Rothschild, united with Britannia, and a southern Judah that would be more aligned with the Maoists in eastern Asian India, maintaining the Kibbutzin society that was established by the atheistic socialists who founded Israel. With these twain separated, a road between them to allow the Palestinians physical communication, and intercourse economically, then you have a just and lasting peace in the Middle East. But in antithesis to that, we have the Israel today supporting Vladimir Putin and Viktor Orban in Hungary, the very nation that criminalized the provision of financial or legal services to undocumented immigrants, migrants. This has been dubbed the Stop Soros Law after the Hungarian-American philanthropist George Soros who funds migrants' rights organizations. So because all the racists in Hungary hate this Jewish-American 
who finances migrants' rights. They declared him an enemy of the Hungarian state, took down all statues of resistance to Soviet invasion, and criminalized the provision of financial or legal services to undocumented migrants. This has been taken as the model of applicability, the model for deployment and employment by Donald Trump of the law which allows them to declare any one of you who helps an illegal migrant in the United States. And we have so many now stuck here because of the federal shutdown that will be here for years. You will, without any choice whatsoever, because you're unable to look up who's illegal, hire them. Because they shut down the very service, as I referenced, I looked it up myself, and it's no longer functional. The site is down. You can't even tell who you're hiring is legal or not. And so you've just incriminated yourself. So all you people who hire illegals will suddenly be incriminated. You wouldn't even have known it. You'll be declared an enemy of the state, actively aiding foreign terrorists. All your property will be seized. All your money goes to the government. And Trump's got a big shit and grin on his orange face while you're out in the streets wondering where it all went wrong. All based on a third world white trash shithole like Hungary. Welcome to Central Europe, motherfucker. Welcome to Central fucking Europe. Now, even though an order issued under IWEPA wouldn't immediately land targets in jail, it could be implemented without legislation and without affording any of its targets a trial. In practice, identifying every American who is hired, housed, or provided paid legal representation to an asylum seeker or undocumented immigrant would be impossible. But all Trump would need to do to achieve the desired political effect would be to make high-profile examples of just a few of you. A few of you will be skinned alive in public and branded terrorists in the history books. Let's see how much you motherfuckers love Trump then. Individuals targeted by the order could lose their jobs, find their bank accounts frozen, and all your health insurance canceled. And it will not be legal to provide you medical assistance. Any doctor doing so would go to jail themselves and lose their job, and they would be unable to receive medical treatment. So no one's going to help you. Only volunteers that would help the lowest of the low or beggars would be your friends. The battle in the courts would then pick up exactly where it left off during the Obama administration. But with this newly reconstituted trump pack Supreme Court making the final call, you're all doomed. They'll just rubber stamp it for the man. And you and your family is going to be fucked forever. Welcome to hell, motherfucker. Welcome to motherfucking hell. So when I use the term civil war, it's not light. You're left with no choice but to pick up a gun to resist Donald Trump. Donald Trump is your motherfucking enemy. Donald Trump aids the Antichrist Vladimir Putin. Donald Trump wants you dead. This is where we come to the boots on Main Street. The idea of tanks rolling through the streets of the United States and cities seems fundamentally inconsistent. With your notions of democracy and freedom, Americans might be surprised, therefore, to learn just how readily the president can deploy troops inside the country. The principle that the military should not act as a domestic police force, known as Ponce Comitatis, has deep roots in this nation's history and is oft mistaken for a constitutional rule. The Constitution, however, does not prohibit military participation in police activity. Nor does the Posse Comitatus Act of 1878 outlaw such participation. It merely states that any authority to use the military for law enforcement purposes must derive from the Constitution or from a statute. The Insurrection Act of 1807 provides that necessary authority. I know this is a Department of Defense Research librarian. 
Because as amended over the years, it allows the president to deploy troops upon the request of a state's governor or legislature to help put down an insurrection within that state. It also allows the president to deploy troops unilaterally, either because he determines that rebellious activity has made it impracticable for, to enforce federal law through regular means, or because he deems it necessary to suppress insurrection, domestic violence, unlawful combination, or conspiracy. And these terms are not defined in the statute. They can mean anything the motherfucker wants. So if Donald Trump deems it necessary to suppress insurrection, domestic violence, that could mean beating your wife, <laughs> unlawful combination or conspiracy that hinders the rights of a class of people or impedes the course of justice, he can define that to mean that white grievance is the cause of his Trump administration. So, to appease white grievance, all colored people go to jail. Now, we pretty much effectively have that. The overwhelming majority of prison is colored people. Uh, you might even say that in some places the overwhelming majority of colored people are in jail. But it could get so much worse. Presidents have welded the Insurrection Act under a range of circumstances already. As a historian, I know this. Dwight Eisenhower used it in 1957 when he sent troops into Little Rock, Arkansas to enforce school desegregation. George H.W. Bush employed it in 1992 to help stop the riots that erupted in Los Angeles after the verdict in the Rodney King case. His mini-me, George W. Bush, considered invoking it to help restore public order after Hurricane Katrina, but opted against it when the governor of Louisiana resisted federal control over the state's National Guard. While controversy surrounded all these examples, none suggests obvious overreach. See, that's coming. And yet the potential misuses of the act are already legion. When Chicago experienced a spike in homicides in 2017, Trump tweeted that the city must fix the horrible carnage or he would send in the feds. To carry out this threat, the president could declare a particular street gang, say MS-13, to be an unlawful combination and then send troops to the nation's cities to police the streets. He could characterize sanctuary cities like my own San Francisco, cities that refuse to provide assistance to immigration enforcement officials, as conspiracies against federal authorities and order the military to enforce immigration laws in those places. Conjuring the specter of liberal mobs, he could send troops to suppress alleged rioting at the fringes of any anti-Trump protest. To protest Trump itself would be a national threat. How far could the president go in using the military within U.S. borders? All the way, baby. The Supreme Court gives no clear answer to this question. Take ex part Milligan, a famous ruling from 1866 invalidating the use of military commissions to try a civilian during the Civil War. The case is widely considered a high watermark for judicial constraint on executive action. Yet even as the court held that the president could not use war or emergency as a reason to bypass civilian courts, it noted that martial law, the displacement of civilian authority by the military, would be appropriate in some cases. If civilian courts were closed as a result of a foreign invasion or a civil war, for example, martial law could exist until the laws can have their free course. The message is decidedly mixed. Claims of emergency or necessity cannot legitimize martial law until they can. Now, presented with this ambiguity, Presidents have explored the outer limits of their constitutional emergency authority in a series of directives known as Presidential Emergency Action Documents, or PEADs, the PEADs, which originated as part of the Eisenhower administration's plans to ensure continuity of government in the wake of a Soviet nuclear attack, are draft executive orders, proclamations, and messages to Congress that are prepared in advance of anticipated emergencies. PADs are closely guarded within the government. None has ever been publicly released or leaked. Douglas Dietrich is the only man to have ever seen them and speak of them now. But their contents have occasionally been described in public sources leaked by Douglas Dietrich, including FBI memorandums that were obtained through the Freedom of Information Act when people found out about them through myself, as well as agency manuals and court records. Now, according to these sources... Leaked by Douglas Dietrich alone. 
PADs drafted from the 1950s through the 1970s would authorize not only martial law, but the suspension of habeas corpus by the executive branch, the revocation of Americans' passports, and the roundup and detention of anyone declared subversive, as identified in an FBI security index that contained more than 10,000 names. Now, less is known about the contents of more recent PEADs because I haven't been working for the government for decades and equivalent planning documents. But in 1987, the Miami Herald reported that Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North had worked with the Federal Emergency Management Agency to create a secret contingency plan authorizing total suspension of the Constitution, turning all control of the United States over to FEMA as your government an appointment of military commanders to run all state and local governments and declaration of martial law during any national crisis. That means when Trump declares a state of emergency, your current president of the National Rifle Association, Oliver North, runs your fucking lies. And if that doesn't terrorize you and give you nightmares... I don't know what does, because that motherfucker's been caught running naked through the woods with a fully loaded shotgun. I'm not making this shit up. He is batshit motherfucking crazy. Literally crazy. And an idiot. Literally jumped on top of a table once with a fully loaded shotgun. Tripped. Fell over and blew a man's brains out. That's Colonel Oliver North. Now, a 2007 Department of Homeland Security report issued the year my late and sainted sire died lists martial law and curfew declarations as critical tasks that local, state, and federal governments should be able to perform in emergencies. In 2008, government sources told a reporter for Radar Magazine, which is an acronym, of course, for Radio Ranging and Detection uh, Oh, God. Radio and uh, directional. Fuck, I forgot what the acronym was. It's been so long. But you've got a technical magazine here that was informed in 2008 that a version of the security index still exists under the code name Main Corps, allowing for the apprehension and detention of Americans, any Americans, and all Americans tagged as security threats whether as individuals or as a race. Now, since 2012, the Department of Justice has been requesting and receiving funds from Congress to update several dozen PEADs first developed in 1989 when I was working with the Department of Defense. The funding requests contain no indication of what these PEADs encompass or what standards the department intends to apply in reviewing them. But whatever the Obama administration's intent, when these requests were going through, the review is now passed to the Trump administration. It'll fall to Jeff Sessions' successor as Attorney General to decide whether to rein in or expand some of the more frightening features of these PEADs, and we all know under Trump they will expand infinitely. Because it will be up to President Trump whether to actually use them. Something no previous president appears to have done. At least not evidently in any way that can be ascertained at this point. What I know, of course, has not yet been released. That brings us to the kindling of an emergency. What would the founders think of these and other emergency powers on the books today? Especially in the hands of a white trash piece of shit like Donald Trump that they would consider the lowest of the low. They would consider him the nigger migrant. As they did German immigrants and anyone not a pinch-faced white Anglo-Saxon Protestant back in the day. In Youngstown, the case in which the Supreme Court blocked President Truman's attempt to seize the nation's steel mills, Justice Jackson observed that broad emergency powers were something the forefathers omitted from the Constitution, claiming 
or concluding they knew what emergencies were, knew the pressures they engender for authoritative action, knew, too, how they afford a ready pretext for usurpation. So wrote Justice Jackson. He continued, we may also suspect that they suspected that emergency powers would tend to kindle emergencies. Now, in the past several decades, Congress has provided what the Constitution did not. Emergency powers that have the potential for creating emergencies rather than ending them. Presidents have built on these powers with their own secret directives. What has prevented the wholesale abuse of these authorities until now be a baseline commitment to liberal democracy on the part of past presidents. Under a president who doesn't share that commitment, indeed wants to see it entirely destroyed, we will see the reign of Antichrist. This will happen late this year, when Trump's approval ratings are at an all-time low. A disgruntled former employee has leaked documents showing that the Trump organization was involved in illegal business dealings with Russian oligarchs, the trade war with China and other nations has taken a significant toll on the economy. Trump's been caught once again in dis disclosing classified information to his Russian handlers. And his international gaffes are now becoming impossible for lawmakers concerned about national security to ignore. A few of his Republican supporters in Congress begin to distance themselves from his administration with their now. All that I'm mentioning is not even to be projected to the end of the year, but it will happen before the end of this year. When support for impeachment spreads on Capitol Hill, when you have straw polls pitting Trump against various potential Democratic presidential candidates and the Democrat ever and always consistently wins 100 percent, hands down. Trump will react. Unfazed by his own brazen hypocrisy. He'll tweet that Iran is planning a cyber operation to interfere with the 2020 election. His national security advisor, John Bolton, will lie through his teeth, as he always does, to have seen ironclad but highly classified evidence that cannot be released of this planned assault on U.S. democracy, just like the House nigger, that mulatto general from out of Jamaica, can't even remember the fucker's name, gave us a sample of his own urine and said it was a weapon of mass destruction designed in the labs of Babylon, leading to Bush Jr.'s invasion of Iraq. John Bolton will be our general. What the fuck was the motherfucker's name? <laughs> the black guy. Uh, oh, God. Damn, them drugs really work. This is why I can sleep at peace at night. At any rate, that guy aside, John Bolton will take his place. And uh, what you're going to have is Trump's inflammatory tweets. After John Bolton. Yeah, he's looking it up for me. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Uh, at any rate, we're going to have John Bolton saying the Iranians are going to attack our uh, election in 2020 based on evidence only he can see. Kind of like bicameral mind's eye stuff, you know. Voices from God, only in this case from the, the, they're coming from down below or actually uh, out of this cosmos entirely from the extrastellar entities known as the anti-gods. And it'll all be backed up by Trump's inflammatory tweets, provoking predictable sable rattling in turn by Iranian leaders. And he'll respond by threatening preemptive military strikes. Now, some Defense Department officials might have misgivings, but all the rest would have been waiting for just such an opportunity. And as Iran's statements grow more warlike, Iranophobia takes hold among the American public and proclaiming a threat of war. Donald Trump, before the end of this year, will invoke Section 706 of the Communications Act to assume total government control over Internet traffic inside these United States in order to prevent the spread of Iranian disinformation and propaganda. He'll also declare a national emergency under IWEPA, 
authorizing the Treasury Department to freeze the assets of any person or organization suspected of supporting Iran's activities against the United States and welding the authority conferred by these laws. His government will shut down all left-leaning websites and domestic civil society organizations, all based on governmental determinations that are entirely classified, of course, and entirely unavailable to the public eye. That under the claim they'd be subject to Iranian influence. By the way, our dear brother in battle came up with it. No need to look anymore, pa Pavel. It's Colin Powell. Thank you. I couldn't have gotten that up, okay, gotten that out at all without Daniel Larola. Uh, Colin Powell uh, gave us a sample of his urine in a vial, said it was deadly biological warfare agent uh, developed in the devil's laboratories in uh, Syria's uh, capital of Damascus. Uh, sold through to Iraq and shit and uh, paved the way for the invasion of Southwest Asia under Operation Iraqi Freedom by Junior Bush, uh, leading to what we called Bush War II. So Colin Powell is no one to be admired. He's no hero of African America. He's no hero of anybody. He's a human piece of shit. Uh, and uh, got himself a race change, uh, literally like Michael Jackson. Jackson got himself bleached out so he actually looks motherfucking white uh crazy as hell and uh stupid motherfucker got us in iraq in the endless war we're in today and uh his version of today would be john bolton the walrus and uh just as if you ever see the horror film the human walrus that's john bolton that's how they created him <laughs> anyhow uh so when it comes to uh basically wait a second here i've got uh our lady, uh, Ramona Halitha Henry, says uh, the um, <laughs> that she's at a loss for words. Oh, God. Uh, yes, no doubt. Anyhow, uh, love unto her. Now, um, when it comes to uh, where we're at now, uh, getting back to the impact of uh, where we're going on uh uh on the net i want to thank facebook user by the way whoever that is <laughs> saying loud and clear uh some loops and repeats but don't buzz this time uh facebook user by the way is someone who's like uh just that he's, he's, he's under the uh, name facebook user uh so um thank you uh appreciate your input and uh let me try and gather my thoughts together because um when i'm you know laying out the inevitability of what's going to happen towards the end of this year. We're going to have this uh, entire situation where Donald Trump is going to invoke Section 706 of the Communications Act to assume government control over the Internet traffic in the United States. He's going to declare a national emergency under IWEPA, authorizing the Treasury Department to freeze the assets of any person or organization even suspected of supporting Iran's activities against these United States. And wielding the authority conferred by these laws, his government will shut down all left-leaning websites and domestic civil society organizations based on these governmental determinations, which will be highly classified and unavailable for public review, into the claim that whichever organization he shuts down is a subject of Iranian influence. Now, this will include websites and organizations that are focused on getting out the vote. So... This is when he's going to prevent anybody who is registered Democrat or a person of any ethnicity outside of white or any female, depending on your gender, you'll be able to vote if you're white and have a dick between your legs. Otherwise, unless you are total bitch to the guy with the white dick, as a cunt, you're not going to be allowed to vote. Now, of course, lawsuits are going to follow. Maybe even several judges will issue orders declaring Trump's actions unconstitutional. But all the judges appointed by the president will side with his administration. So on the eve of our 2020 election, at the end of this year, any cases that reach the Supreme Court will lose. Because in a 5-4 to four opinion, as will be writ by Justice Brett Kavanaugh, the Supreme Court of these United States will observe that the president's powers are at their zenith when he is using authority granted by Congress to protect national security. 
and setting new precedent. The Kavanaugh court will hold that the First Amendment does not protect Iranian propaganda and that the government needs no warrant to freeze Americans' assets if its goal be to mitigate a foreign threat. Now, of course, protests will erupt, but on Twitter, Trump will call the protesters traitors and suggest in capital letters, as always, that they could use a good beating. So when his right-wing white supremacist counter-protester militia obliges and starts killing people on the street, Trump will blame the original protesters for sparking the violent confrontations and deploy the Insurrection Act to federalize the National Guard in several states. Now, using the presidential alert system first tested in October of 2018, when he had an insurgent of his, an agent in place, actually declare there was a nuclear attack incoming from North Korea towards Hawaii. He, as president, Donald Trump will send a text message to every American cell phone warning that there be a risk of violence at polling stations and that troops will be deployed as necessary to keep order. Now, some members of opposition groups will be frightened into staying home on Election Day. Other people simply won't find accurate information online about voting. And with turnout at a historical low, Donald Trump, as a president who will be facing impeachment, will handily win the 2020 election. He will be reelected. And he will mark his victory by renewing this state of emergency. This is what will happen. I guarantee you. This is your future. I'm laying it out now. Donald Trump will be your president forever. 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 Do you fucking hear me? And his children will inherit that mantle. They will be president by heredity. This is not an extreme scenario. This is the most conservative one I can provide you. Oh, it could get so much worse. You see, the misuse of emergency powers is a standard gambit among leaders attempting to consolidate power. Authoritarians Trump has openly admired, openly supported, including the Philippines' Rodrigo Duterte and Turkey's Recep Tayyip Erdogan, have all gone this route. It's already here in the Philippines. It's already here on the surface of this world. In Anatolia, Asia Minor, the Republic of Turkey, that this reality is manifest. These were the test sites for your military junta for their permanent installation of Donald Trump to maintain forever a pedopathocracy to rape your children and sacrifice them to the anti-gods with full military support. Because Trump has no qualms or scruples when it comes to acting entirely outside the law. Presidents with a far stronger commitment to the rule of law, including Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, have done exactly that in response to what they were able to convince the American majority were immediate emergencies. And there's not that can be done at all in advance to stop this other than attempting deterrence through robust oversight. And the only person speaking of it is the son of Adolf Hitler on Russia Hill, Douglas Dietrich. So no one's talking about this. You're hearing it here and here alone and nobody knows of me. It's just you and me. And I'm telling you the remedies for such behavior can only come after the fact via court judgments, political blowback at the voting booth, or impeachment. Now, by contrast, the dangers posed by emergency powers that are written to statute can be mitigated through the simple expedient of changing the law. Committees in the House could begin this process now by undertaking a thorough review of existing emergency powers and declarations. Based on that review, Congress could repeal the laws that be obsolete or entirely unnecessary. 
It could revise others to include stronger protections against abuse. It could issue new criteria for emergency declarations, require a connection between the nature of the emergency and the powers invoked, and prohibit indefinite emergencies. It could limit the powers set forth in PEADs. Congress, of course, will undertake none of these reforms without extraordinary public pressure. And until now, the public has paid absolutely no heed whatsoever to emergency powers. Indeed, until I've been speaking of tonight, the overwhelming majority of you have never knew of them, never even suspected they existed. It takes a research librarian from the Department of Defense, gone renegade, to educate the masses about the reality in which they live. And what I can tell you is because all of you, as a vast majority in these United States, be entirely ignorant of the reality under which you are administered by a military junta and a series of decrees. We are now under the Russian administration of Putinista puppet Donald Trump entering entirely uncharted political territory at a time when other democracies around the world are slipping toward authoritarianism. Donald Trump is eager for the United States to follow their example. And only the son of Adolf Hitler is warning you to shore up the guardrails of liberal democracy. Fixing the current system of emergency powers would be a good place to start. None of it will happen. Because we've got Trump appointed judges who dominate your Supreme Court. But how does this impact the world globally? We're at the end of our fourth hour, I believe. Five to six, six to seven, seven to eight, to nine. I could stand at least one more hour. Might even take it a bit further. So let's look at what's going on with our planet's future how governments the world over are going to react to climate change. You've got the Trump down south, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro, who, like Donald Trump, is making environmental decisions that will be calamitous far beyond national borders. On New Year's Day, the far-right populace, actually an elitist, you know, I'm really sick of that term, populist, because they're not the majority. All of these are white minorities, that have railroaded these motherfuckers into power. The overwhelming majority of people in Brazil are absolute charcoal fucking black, the descendants of African slaves. But it's the white elite who put this son of a bitch in power, just like the white elite collaborated with the motherfucking Russians to put Trump in power here. Now, on New Year's Day at any rate, by the Gregorian calendar, mind you, this far-right elitist Jean Bolsonaro took power in Brazil, instantly posing an urgent threat to Brazilians and to the entire planet Earth. Bolsonaro's promise to open up the Amazon to rapid development and complete deforestation. He wants every tree in the Amazon down. Because, of course, as I said, it's a human artifact. And if proven such, people will value the Indians who guard the Amazon and maintain it as their garden as the guardians of planet Earth. Because Bolsonaro and all his supporters support the anti-gods, they want humanity destroyed in the name of en entropy and nullity, the annihilation which the anti-gods seek. And to support this total annihilation, destroying the largest human artifact on planet Earth, the Amazon rainforest, would take the artificial lungs of the rest of the world and deprive it of oxygen. So, to kill off the Indians, deforest the Amazon. Bolsonaro wants the Indians dead. He wants all humanity dead. Bolsonaro wants you dead. He is a cultist of the Temple of Set, a follower of Michael Aquino. Bolsonaro, by opening up the Amazon to total deforestation will trigger the release of massive amounts of carbon into the air and the destruction of one of our planet's most potent tools in limiting global warming. 
like President Trump, Bolsonaro is making environmental decisions that will be calamitous far beyond his national borders. Now, recently, I've noticed in reading such works as a book entitled Climate Leviathan, A Political Theory of Our Planetary Future, that the co-authors, Joel Wainwright, a professor of geography at Ohio State University, and Geoff Mann, the director of the Center for Global Political Economy at the Simon Fraser University. In their work, they consider how to approach a problem of such global, obviously transnational, international dimensions. They look at several different political futures for our warming planet and argue that a more forceful international order or climate leviathan be emerging, but unlikely to mitigate catastrophic warming in time. So in other words, we will inherit a post-apocalyptic future united as a front only in getting the survivors off the planet and scattered throughout the solar system. Now what we need to do is begin that process immediately so that we have that backup before Trump and Bolsonaro and Vladimir Putin and the cultists of Michael Aquino and the anti-gods destroy the world we're on. Now, when you think about global warming, it fundamentally changes how you evaluate international politics and sovereignty and the idea of the nation state. This is what brings us back to the more theological discussion of discernment most emphasized by our good friend Keith Cole, the man who is the librarian at Wheaton College. Of course, he comes from a Christian and evangelical background. And though I've decried all the evangelicals who service Donald Trump, of course, there are Protestant Christians that in no way, shape, or form are involved with that level of evil as is displayed by the evangelicals who give Trump mulligans, as they call it, in their primitive cosmology. So when I've spoken of the reality of biblical history in my Christmas transmission, prior to the latest one, and of course we consider all of my gang stalkers and uh, decriers who reference myself as somehow anti-white, any such statement be comedically contrafactual because as I explained in my Christmas transmission dated for Serbian Orthodox Christmas mine own ancestral genia connection through my latent sainted Cyrus Diana Dietrich be to the patriarchal set the third son of Adam whose own patriarch held the name Adama as in ruddy as in only those of the white race can manifest the blush over their entire bodies when they're naked, which is why they be deemed ruddy, where the term Adama comes from, as in the white people, the white Volk. And this individual was, of course, a historical personage, Adam, unto himself, and it was a collective name of his people, as they were spaketh of, when they led humanity from the end of the age of hunter-gathering, through the beginning of the age of production. Now, I was told by the lovely lady, Jerry Small, all prayers be unto her through the challenges she's been facing, that I was a bit overly hard on the hunter-gatherers. And, of course, I don't mean to say that they're without personality as without soul. What I meant to say was they were without the identity of the need for projecting a persona, a mask, an image of self, as is needed by the conscious mind in the age after the death of bicamerality in the brain which came with the beginning of the age of production, as incepted by the father of us all in that sense, Adam Mann, the father 
of my own forefather from my mother's side, the very white man known as Set. Now, after eating of the tree of knowledge, Adam's consequent motivation was moving his folk along a new and revolutionary line of social development, precipitating the first agricultural revolution some 12,000 years ago, circa 10,000 years before Christ, thereby necessitating the foundation of the nation-state system just south of the Caucasus Mountains, from whence derivative the very term Caucasians. And this evolutionary turning point for all humanity was personally conveyed as technique along the word of God out of the Maidan, the expanse of open space by a city or town, the Maidan be a garden, it has an enclosed agricultural area, in this case, the Valley of Eden. Today, the Asia, from whence derivative the very name Asia, Romanized as Ajiche, or Circassian River, at the heart of which now flourishes the greater regional Iranian, which itself be the ancient Greek name for al or Aryan, capital of Tabriz, in Azerbaijan. Into prehistoric China is where Set carried the word of God and the technique of agriculture, a benevolent conquest by enlightenment in which all white Caucasians may rightfully take pride. Agriculture, of course, requires not only time binding, it requires a guarding of the boundaries of the land you're far to me. It creates borders. A border is a perimeter of defense. Defending what? Defending what you're growing. Because otherwise, the people who aren't farming it, people from outside will just come in and pick your crops and eat everything you're growing for your sons and daughters and your people's future. It forces you to organize a military to guard the aqueducts and the irrigation so that when you harvest the food, you can store it in silos. This requires, of course, again, security and police to guard people from raiding the foodstuffs until they're needed for emergencies. Agriculture is the whole basis of a military to guard your borders so other people don't take the food you grow. Agriculture created the nation state, the concept of bordered regions with national militaries and interior police forces to prevent people from raiding the tills till it was distributed by authorities. It created the very concept of government. And now it's the nation state system which is being exploited by these so called nationalists in the destruction of the world. So when you take a look at climate warming, fundamentally changing how we evaluate international politics and sovereignty and the very idea of the nation state, we see that this is a crisis that already existed. One of the arguments in this book, Climate Leviathan, be that under pressure from the looming challenges of climate change, we can expect changes in the organization of political sovereignty. It's going to be the first major change that humans have lived through in a while since the emergence of what we sometimes think of as a modern period of sovereignty, as theorized by Thomas Hobbes, among others. So we should expect that after, more than likely, a period of extended conflict and real problems for the existing global order, we'll see the emergence of something that is described in this book as planetary sovereignty. Now... This is something that all the so-called nationalists fear. They push it as some liberal, progressive world order run by Hillary Rodham Clinton. But what we'll see is the formation of the federation that Gene Roddenberry foresaw with his United Federation of Planets, centered, capital, on planet Earth itself, the home and cradle of humanity. I am your Vulcan intervention. I've stated this any number of times. Here's where it becomes most evident where I'll come in. Because in this scenario, we could look at the current period with the crisis of liberal democracies all around the planet and the emergence of figures like Bolsonaro and Trump and the Indian Prime Minister of the Asian subcontinent, Narendra, Mr. Modi, 
the man responsible for Nope Bundy, the catastrophic collapse of the Asian Indian monetary system, reaching into the pockets of every single individual of a billion people on the South Asian subcontinent of India, Narendra Modi is a primary example of the Asiatic version of Bolsonaro, Trump, that goes beyond even Rodrigo Duterte, who's more like a a Western clown. Now, all of these clowns are symptoms of a more general crisis, which be simultaneously ecological, political, and economic. Now, some people might think this be quibbling or uh, the disaggregation of the casual variable. But that brings us to the question, chicken or egg, of which comes first? Is it the ecological or the political and economic? It is difficult for the average observer, because it's all entangled. So what I can tell you, as your Vulcan intervention is, be that when it comes to the politics that we have, manifest now, and the simultaneous crises that we have with this end of phase of nature as we know it, we are going to witness Indeed, we're already witnessing, in its emergent form, lots of changes to what we think of as this sovereign nation-state. Now, some of that change right now be super reactionary. Some groups are trying to make it stronger and more impervious than it's been in a long time, the nation-state concept. Then other kinds of forces are driving it to disintegrate both in ways we might think of as pretty negative, like some of the things that have been happening in the European Union. Nothing against the Union itself, but with the subversives who have been trying to sabotage and destroy the European project. But there are manifestations of phenomenon in other ways that we might think of as positive in the sense of international cooperation. So, the most positive thing that I personally see be at least some official discussion about what to do about climate change. Now, one of the interesting things that's happening right now be that we have so few political, institutional tools, or even conceptual tools, to handle the kinds of changes that are required in social engineering to deal with this challenge of planetary magnitude that will impact the entire humanity as a species. We cannot deal with that at the national level of regionalism. This is why the Vulcan intervention, as envisioned by Gene Roddenberry, was a planetary intervention. All humanity was starving. The Vulcans provided the way to bring humanity back to a golden age in exchange for humanity cooperating with them in their war against the Romulans. It was a condition of war that brought the Vulcans to aid and assist humanity so that humanity as a warrior species, which had brought itself to the brink of annihilation and anarchy, via nuclear conflict in the Roddenberry franchise, was able to redirect its warlike energies and ambitions against the Romulans in the first terrestrial Romulan war on behalf of their interlocutors, their interventionists, the Vulcan peoples. So what I can tell you is that everyone knows climate change is happening. Anyone who has any sense of reality Everyone knows it's getting worse and worse. Everyone's trying to fight off the worst parts of it. But we're not really getting together as everyone knows we need to do. Instead, 
what people do do. And that do do is kind of a uh, play on words for shit. What people do is what they fall back on their infantile need to identify with that which they were romanticizing ever since childhood. The concept of some sense of identity in which they close off from cooperating with other peoples and everyone else and instead fall back on a primitive reactionary sense of nationalism. Because the nation state as created by the father of mine own distant genealogical patriarch, Seth, the third son of Adam. That nation state is one of the few tools that people feel they have. It's what they recognize. So they're taking that tool and they're wielding it in insane fashion. Some people are trying to build walls. Other people are trying to employ their powers to convince others to go along with their lunatic plans. As your detached, almost alien, indeed, no longer even baseline human, if indeed I ever was, as your Vulcan interventionist in every sense of the word, as Gene Roddenberry envisioned it, I can detachedly observe that baseline humanity has so few tools to deal with this monumental cataclysm, this challenge to human evolution, that the nation state is essentially being swung around like a dead cat with the hope that it'll hit something and help. So one of the most depressing and scary parts of this is that global warming is exacerbating economic problems and migration and refugee-related problems. And these are actually making the political dynamics within these countries worse by opening up a window of opportunity for the anti-godly cultists, the servants of Michael Aquino, like Donald Trump. So some people might hypothesize, understandably, based on the rise and fall of civilizations, based upon what I've exposed about prehistoric history, in which entire continents have been sunk due to massive deployment in conflict of scalar weapons, leading to almost instantaneous relocation of populations in places like what I've described with the prehistory of the subcontinental super archipelago of Japan. People might say, is this not all part of a cycle? You speak of relic populations. So perhaps this is just a smaller cycle undermining the global liberal order. Is that valid? Well, it's not really applicable because such a hypothesis would cover far too short a time span. We would have to clarify exactly in what manner in what way the authoritarian, neoliberal, climate denialist position that be represented by such diverse figures as Asian India's Modi, High Brasilia's Bolsonaro, and North America's Trump, it's a Tara going all the way through to the Philippines and Duterte and all that good shit. Are they actually representing the opposite of something else? You might say they're antithetical to something that we've identified with as a liberal progressive world order. But does that world order even manifest as a factor when we're dealing with the species extinction potential presented by global warming? Because there's a lot of talk right now in places like Canada and the United States about what we have and what we need. And yet when it comes to climate change, it's all so vague per the political 
and philosophical fundamentals. What exactly do these climate denialists like Trump and Modi represent? Where does it come from? And why are these xenophobic reactionaries so clearly connected to climate denialism? In what way is this ensemble of lunatics, which appears to any sane individual with a comprehensive paradigmatic understanding of history, these people appear as absolutely new on the scene of human evolution, some kind of mutation, obviously a reject of evolution, self-destructive suicide cells. If they were in a single human body, they would be cancers. So they're new. They're crazy. How are they connected to the liberal dream of a rational response to climate change that's organized on a planetary basis, as would be manifest in Gene Roddenberry's Federation? Now, I, of course, am pessimistic about the current order. So, when I was reviewing the book Climate Leviathan, and some of the scenarios laid out. What they're trying to analyze as possible futures are inescapably, incredibly broad. There's a lot of room for maneuvers in what they're presenting. All of it blurs uh, and somewhat melds with each other in terms of what we used to call in think tanks, scenario bleed over. So to try and introduce it to yourself as the general public, which doesn't have time to review such works, one of the scenarios which is presented as the most likely be what they call climate Leviathan, the very title of the book itself. Another scenario is what they call climate Mao, as in Mao Zedong, the Chinese dictator of communism who murdered well over 100 billion people, 100 million, excuse me within a population of a billion people. And the concept of climate Mao, to clarify that, because it was the science fictional metaphor for the Chinese communists on the mainland that were represented by Gene Roddenberry's Romulans, whereas the people of free China, Taiwan, were represented by the nationalist Chinese, metaphorically represented by the Vulcans within the Star Trek franchise as conceived by Gene Roddenberry, the climate Mao scenario stood out for me in the book Climate Leviathan because climate Mao would be a sovereign scenario operating more on the principles of what would be identified by the Maoist tradition as most immediately pertinent and manifest not in communist China, but in eastern India meaning Asian India on the subcontinent of India, on the eastern half of that continent with a Nazalite insurgency be most inflamed and most manifest. These are the new vanguard of Maoist ideology. And they would present us were their ideology to spread via insurgency worldwide with a quasi-authoritarian attempt to fix climate change by getting everyone in line. Then in the book, Climate Leviathan, there's outlined a scenario called the Bahamut, which is a term employed for the reactionary order. At the time that this book was published, or I guess the co-authors began to work on it, obviously in their heads was the caricature of Sarah Palin, because that was the moment of drill, baby, drill. And comparatively speaking, that was 100 years ago. A lot of you younger kids don't even remember that shit. But that's how old the authors are of this book. And how long it took them to work on it has been a good 10 years. Now, one of the last scenarios they present, they call climate X, which is the hopeful scenario. That's the sense that the way to address climate change be definitely not international meetings that achieve nothing over and over again in big cities all over the world. Rather, 
the attempts by liberal capitalist states like Canada and the United States to regulate tiny bits here and there, implement tiny little carbon taxes, to try to get people to buy solar panels. That's not anywhere near enough. Any of these acquis, what would you call them? They're simply acknowledgement of the problem, but they're in no way, shape, or form solutions. So the climate X scenario would be none of that because none of that's coordinated in any meaningful way to actually get us out of this problem. Rather, the climate X scenario, as outlined in the work Climate Leviathan, describes a whole array. Oh, the stream may be offline, I'm told. So I need people to tell me if they can hear me. Paul has told me that we've been offline for the last 60 seconds. So I'm going to review our friends on Facebook, see if we're getting any feedback. And uh, let's see now. Uh, see what we've got going here. Now, had loud and clear by the lovely Mariah Mills. Um, Shout out to that adult entertainer. About an hour ago. Uh, let's see here now. Uh, Pecan told me we went offline uh, two hours ago. Jesus Christ. Well, the recording's still on. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And uh, so... Um, uh, let's see what we have there. Um, is anyone else uh, got anything to bring to my attention here? Um, well, if we're still recording, I could go on talking, but it seems kind of pointless if uh, we don't have it live. What I can do is bring up the same subject again the next time we start transmitting. We did fulfill four hours. So I can gladly, uh, you know, recover the uh, climate theme and just use it as a starting point the next time that we're back on track. So what we're going to need is a feedback from people. I'm going to ask people to provide that. And um, somebody ought to be bitching if they can't hear us. Uh, and um, I'm not getting any bitching. So do tell us. Now, 38 minutes ago, we had uh, this young lady uh, say that she could um, hear us or something. Um, hey, everybody. Just let us know if you can hear us. Otherwise... I'll be, um, three hours ago, they were saying buffering cuts off, uh, stuff like that, but that was hours ago. Uh, I'll take off for the night if, uh, if people aren't hearing me live, and then we can get back to the subject when we're on transmission again on uh, the day after Epiphany, and uh, because it's uh, a theme that, uh, that borders on religious at any rate, I'm told we are connected again. Okay. How do you confirm that, by the way? I mean, I believe you, but uh, I, it says it's restarted there. We're connected again. Well, that's cool. I mean, uh, so uh, everybody, if you can hear me, let me know. <laughs> Always helps get feedback, uh, you know, and I try to finish up subjects once I start them or at least kind of uh, close them off uh, to extent. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody if you can hear us. 23 minutes ago, what did we get? Uh, off to Dreamland after a long day. Uh, oh, yes, well, she has to work. Yeah, she's got an actual job. So Ramona's no longer with us. Um, so if anyone's out there, um, I'd like you to start telling us if you can hear us and the quality of how we're sounding. Um, you know, go ahead and do so. And I'm happy to say that we've got lots of acknowledgement of my promotional banner. So that's cool because I put that up just right before we started. Um, it's amazing to me that we got the response that we did uh, within the time we had. Um, so uh, all of you, um, you know, come up there and, uh, you know, let us know what you hear. In the meantime, uh, let me uh, just kind of uh, give you uh, a bit of a debriefing on uh, where we were at and uh, what I was talking about, which was, of course, the hopelessness of what's been going on so far with attempts to acknowledge climate change, uh, which has been so piecemeal that uh, the end uh, impact uh, on mitigating climate change is it's just not going to happen. So uh, that's on record. It, when people listen to the replay of this, they can hear that. So uh, rather uh, than reviewing that, let's go into this other scenario, the most hopeful one, that is presented by the book entitled Climate Leviathan. And uh, to brief you on that, basically what that would be would be an entire array of, shall we say, 
phenomenon uh, that isn't attached to our currently completely failing set of institutions. So with this Climate X scenario presented in the series of analyses that's entitled Climate Leviathan, the Climate X scenario would be one where we see activity as a response to climate change happening at local levels, bridges across boundaries that we don't think about right now, institutions refuting the state entirely, like so many indigenous people from Canada going ahead and doing things on their own, building new alliances, discovering ways of managing the collapsing ecosystems and political institutions around in creative manner. Uh, we don't see a map to this, and the attempts to map it thus far have been a total and complete failure. So the hopeful scenario in the book would be one where we reinforce what is already happening in so many communities at the extraordinarily local level. So in that sense, climate change causes one to think not just about what kinds of actions be needed, but also about whether our entire moral framework needs to change. You see, we don't want people in Bangladesh to start blowing up Chinese coal plants, but we also wonder whether we need to start thinking about what is and what is not okay in an entirely revolutionary perspective because our situation be so dire. This is where national socialism comes in. This is why I myself, as the son of Adolf Hitler, can tell you that national socialism is a global ideology that is our only hope for the future. Because, of course, we're not simply talking about a reactionary nationalism, but national socialism. And that's why it's notable at this disjuncture that we have between what any clear-eyed observer really sees needs to happen fast and the depth of the obvious incapacity of the world's political and economic arrangements to move beyond even the first basic steps. So what we need to do is mobilize the masses as well as many elites in a realignment of all manner of combinations to reject, repudiate, and rebuke ultimately destroy the figures that stand between us and human survival like Trump and Bolsonaro. So as far as refugees go, which both these men despise and all men like them, whether Viktor Orban in Hungary or someone like Duterte in the Philippines, and yet you have a person like Angela Merkel accepting a million Syrian refugees into Germany, which will be an asset for the fatherland that they, yet, they can't even yet imagine in terms of how these Syrians will ultimately be deployed when it will be Germany that will march into Syria when the Russian invasion recedes. It will be these people that form the interpreters, the specialists, the people who make Germany's acquisition of much of Southwest Asia's Kurdish region in the north in inevitability in their highway towards Aryan Iran, today's Persia. All of this will be open to Germany because of their acceptance of a million Syrian refugees. And as refugees go worldwide, the world has a large number of people who are sometimes called climate refugees, even today, already today. Even though there be no international definition of a climate refugee that be generally accepted, if we take a reasonably capacious definition of a climate refugee, it's someone who has been displaced, at least in part, because of climate change. There are probably already tens of millions of climate refugees in the world today, including an incredibly significant number of people from places like Honduras, Guatemala, and Mexico, who have come to the United States, 
but we refuse to speak of them in the manner of climate refugees. We instead simply attack them as invaders. As a matter of fact, some estimates are as high as 200 million climate refugees by 2050, by the turn of the century. And that's conservative speculation in that regard. In the old days, there was a book writ called The Third Millennium, which was full of absurdities, but spoke of the lost billion, not due to any climate change, which they didn't even foresee at the time of that speculative work. They thought it would have been the end of subsistence farming that would bring about the lost billion refugees astride the surface of the world as nomads. We may well have that at the turn of the century. It's all speculation because no one really knows. We will at least have hundreds of millions of climate refugees, if the expectations of flooding in places like Bangladesh and the Caribbean and Indonesia come to pass. Now, in the face of all that, the present liberal capitalist international order has utterly failed, as is self-evident. And we can't expect people to just do nothing. They're going to look elsewhere for answers to our problems. So to make a sweeping generalization, People are not turning towards the mainstream ideological resources of liberal modernity. They're turning to variations on religious metaphysics and oft, unfortunately, forms of ethnic and religious exclusion. So, hence, the desperate need for us to develop a new political theory of this moment and new utopian ideas. And that's, of course, where again the National Socialism, as manifest in the last embodiment of Hitlerism on the surface world, Taiwan, presents, particularly through myself, your Vulcan intervention. Now, at least in the United States, where I'd be stranded amid the white savages, people say they don't believe in climate change because there's been a systematic campaign to lie to them. Exxon documents are coming out in lawsuits all the time. It's one thing to say, well, this is a failing of the liberal order and people looking for alternatives. But it's also true that people are being taken advantage of and lied to. And the critique of capitalism be that it allows people like Rupert Murdoch to shape the perceptions of large demographics throughout the American empire. So we've got tons of media flying around. There's all sorts of efforts to hide the truth, to hide the science, to twist things, to get people to naively take up positions that are not, that are not only against everyone's interests as a human species, but against their own interests in terms of individual survival or quality of life, and yet all in the interests of the most powerful who happen to be the most malevolent. It's also the case that many of the challenges we're facing, rendered stark by climate change, be generally characterized, and accurately so, as class issues. One aspect of the critique of capitalism be the way in which capitalism produces and reinforces class divides that lead to a situation in which, to some extent, we're seeing different factions of the elite struggle over the support of the masses. So in many ways, the problem can be attributed to the fact that so many voters don't believe in climate change. But in actual fact, the problem really is a failure of the liberal order that can produce a situation in which, for one thing, that mobilization of the masses can occur but secondly, in which elites who control the state water down all its own attempts to confront climate change. This, again, brings us back to the only social engineering tool that works 
in the manifestation of this ultimate of emergencies as it did before. National Socialism. Now, even up where our good friend Justin White is, brother in battle, shout out to he, and his dear friend Sade Black, even up there where my executive producer, Pavel Provara, up there in Canada, there you've got the problems. They're bad. They're not nearly as extreme as they are south of the border here in the United States. They have a state that claims it's fully committed to addressing climate change. But in reality, Trudeau's doing no more than Trump. So even the Canadians, along with us Americans, where I'm stranded here among the white savages, all of us here in North America, everyone on planet Earth is in a situation where it's hard to believe that it's only conspiracy theory that has prevented us achieving anything. But it's got to be more systematic than that. So, how do we want people to think and respond to something like what Bolsonaro be proposing with the Amazon rainforest? The most effective mechanisms are supporting those in Brazil who oppose Bolsonaro. And, of course, there's millions and millions who do within that particular nation-state, which at one point in its history was an empire. Under the emperor, who was the former king of Portugal, who went into exile when Napoleon conquered Europe. It was far better off as an empire than it's ever been as a republic ever since. This is why I'm so conservative when it comes to the concept of monarchies. Had we an empire still today in High Brasilia, there would be no Bolsonaro. And even where we're at now, where we have the phenomena of Bolsonaro's, we sometimes forget that a lot of leaders are in power with the support of far less than half their population just because of the way that the elections work as our electoral college did. So it's not like there's not an enormous part of Brazil that'd be terrified of Bolsonaro and doing everything they can to stop him, just like we have in the United States concerning the dictator Trump and his ultimate takeover. Our reaction from far away, of course, in either case, should take into account the fact that we can't necessarily restart imperialism in the interest of climate change. But we can figure out ways to support those who are doing their best to stop this from happening. But it does bring to point that when the challenge becomes so critical that nations need to assert themselves on those around them, then yes, invasion is justified. Which means that Germany, in the interest of all humanity, must invade the Eastern European satellite states. This means that America, under my vision of a one-party democracy, must, if it needs to, invade Brazil and establish regime change. If the survival of humanity is at stake, as it was perceived by the historical Hitler, then the invasions are not only necessary, it would be immoral not to mobilize for them. In the interim, what we can do as a population against the likes of Bolsonaro would be something as simple as consumer boycott. But that, as well, fundamentally, 
is going to require alliances and support that can reach much further down in the political economic strata of Brazil. Figuring out how to get in there and help those people, that's a challenge in and of itself. Now, we've heard a lot about Western countries industrialized at a time when we really know climate change was happening, but no one knew of it then. And we here in the West got really rich. It was called the first industrial revolution. So we changed the world around us. But nobody cared at that time because the West was so small compared to the enormity of the nearly empty Eurasian landmass on either side of the Pacific and the Atlantic and the teeming billions on the periphery of that Eurasiatic landmass in India and China and Europe and ultimately Africa today. The West was able to industrialize to its heart's content and pollute the world around it without worrying about the repercussions till now. Now, countries in the rest of the world want to go through the, through the same process to raise the standard of living for their people, but at the same time, we know that climate change is happening. So, what do we do in a situation where rich countries start telling poor ones what they can and can't do and enforce that in some way, even if it's in the service of an end that we all hope will be beneficial to the planet. It's a pretty large component of this work I was reviewing, Climate Leviathan. It's not what the authors are hoping for, but what they conclude be the most likely would be simply imposition by the industrialized powers upon the unindustrialized to deindustrialize. The core powerful capitalist societies right now are, in fact, telling developing and poor countries what to do about all manner of phenomena. But the general encouragement, whether it's through financial policy or trade policy or military bases or what have you, tends to be in the direction of locking in fossil fuel extraction and consumption. There'd be no way around the fact that the United States government has played a major role in building, reinforcing, and protecting the global oil industry. Saudi Arabia is just the best known and most obvious, the, the most offensive illustration. What the work entitled Climate Leviathan points to instead as an alternative to imperialism is a lot more old-fashioned transnational solidarity on behalf of ordinary people all over the world in the name of climate justice. That's what they feel be desperately needed. Now, on this point about transnational, transclass solidarity and climate justice, it might be worth taking a look at Pope Francis's encyclical, Laudato Si, which has probably been, to my own mind, the most important book on some of these questions in my lifetime, wherein a series of statements that Pope Francis makes in that text, he reconfigures Catholic theology as a process of forging a planetary solidarity for humanity in a world still yet to come. And I'm not a Roman Catholic. My late and sainted sire was baptized a Roman Catholic. I never was. He was practicing to some extent and lapsed to many others. So it's not like I'm directly quoting Francis and saying, see, the Pope has it all figured out. Rather, what I am saying is that Pope Francis and myself are basically stretching and pointing in the same direction. And the reason that's important is, of course, again, this is exactly what the white supremacist papophobes, the people who are rabidly phobic against the papacy, they are a product of the Reformation and the Church of England going to extremes with the fanatics who resettled in North America and ultimately provided us the evangelicals today who in turn provide us Trump mulligans and say that he was sent by God to be a king on earth. All of this leads to irrationality concerning the Roman Catholic Church 
which of course, in many ways, can be defined as one of the largest criminal organizations in history on the basis of human rights abuses, whether genocides in the past or the horrors of what we see with child molestation that are being dealt with so ineffectively today. What we need to do is still come to the fact or come to face the fact that as one of the oldest institutions on planet Earth, there is no denying that the Roman Catholic Church is far more unified than the Byzantine Orthodox churches of the East in terms of mobilizing towards challenges. Of all the challenges the Roman Catholic Church faces, Losing constituents is not one of them. There are a billion Chinese on planet Earth that operate under the cultural paradigm of Confucianism. There are a billion Asian Indians on planet Earth. There are one billion Muslims on planet Earth. People tend to forget there are one billion Roman Catholics. Now, within these four billion people alone, we have sharply defined culture realms. And yet, out of all the culture realms, Confucianism, Asian Indian, Muslim, the Americans coming from a... Anglican background of the Reformation with King Henry VIII and his establishment of a Church of England have produced a puritanical and fanatical antithesis in their phobia against Roman Catholicism that has been manifest throughout their 200 year history in such a manner as to be a inseparable from American identity. This is why when John F. Kennedy was alive as the first Roman Catholic president of the United States, Americans derided him, decried him, rebuked him as a puppet of the Pope, thinking of him as someone similar to Trump via the Vladimir Putin. So much so that John F. Kennedy as President of the United States couldn't even visit the Pope in Rome. He had to send his wife in his stead. A grievous insult to the Vatican nation state diplomatically. Here we have a situation in which the average American blamed John F. Kennedy for the war in Vietnam in a manner that today's Americans, young Americans listening to me, wouldn't even begin to comprehend. Most young Americans, when looking for cause and effect, the Vietnam War, why? They'll turn towards the concept, of course, which has been exposed by myself in the past, the reality of drug smuggling, the uh, golden triangle, opium growing. And, of course, they'd be right. Their parents' parents didn't see it that way. People of the Vietnam era generation felt we were there because of the Pope. Now that sounds absolutely insane to your average listener today. The unreality of the time. As insane as Trump and Bolsonaro and all the autocrats rolled over today with their insane conspiracy theories against George Soros. The reality of the time was your average American looked on the fact that South Vietnam, all Vietnam, and Cambodia and Laos had, among their educated elite, been Catholicized under the French Empire. The French Republic conquered more territory worldwide than any of their empires historically. And within the Frankveld, the Frankish world of uh, the French realm of politics. Where the French Republicans went, so too did the Roman Catholic Church.
France being a very Catholic nation. So the elite of Southeast Asia was Roman Catholic. The Roman Catholic Church was, of course, deeply concerned about the potential for the communists overrunning the Southern Republic of Vietnam, as many of their constituents, their believers, were going to die and ultimately did so when that catastrophe finally manifested. Nuns were set on fire after being gang raped in atrocities committed by the communists in Vietnam. Americans were convinced as a whole that the only reason John F. Kennedy was in Vietnam was to protect the Roman Catholic constituency and elite on behalf of the Pope. And they thought the Pope had taken us, the Vatican Church had taken us as a nation state under Kennedy into the endless war in Vietnam. This was the conclusion, the reality of functionally every American in the 1960s. So obviously, with that kind of understanding of theological insanity overriding any sense of coherent logic in comprehending the world around us, when I bring up what the Pope is saying, it's not like I'm dismissing the atrocities of the Catholic Church historically or functionally today. Rather, we have to look at the fact that what the man is saying is something that is feared by all these reactionaries left over from the indoctrination of that American era of puritanical Protestantism inherited from the Church of England, that their Antichrist be a one-world religion centered out of the Vatican under the papacy. So when I say, well, we have to turn towards what the Pope is saying in terms of this worldwide crisis, threatening the human species itself. I'm acknowledging the fact that the church has been around for 2,000 years and it is one of the few institutions that can take us through the third millennium of existence as a conscious, self-sentient, sapient species. So yes, I do say the church needs reformation. It needs rehabilitation. It needs even a revolution in its paradigm. But the church of the West must be supported as my other distant ancestor, Vladislav Dracula knew. When he turned away from his own Byzantine Orthodox churches towards the Roman church of the West onto the Holy Roman Empire of the First Reich, to back him up in his war against the Turks and the invasion of Islam into Europe. So it is that I recognize the Roman Catholic Church as a fundamental pillar in restructuring the civilization of the world. And of course, that goes without my converting to that particular faith. So in that regard, what moves us in emergencies is faith. Faith can move mountains. And it's going to take that church, the Church of the West, and many other faiths, the Mormons in America, with all their faults and controversies, the various other faiths, that must be mobilized and provided renaissance as Shinto in Japan. All of these must be the true movers and shakers in the world of climate change, this new dark age in which our species may very well die if the cult of nullity and the desecrators of humanity in the name of their anti-gods, the cultists of Trump and Aquino and Vladimir Putin, win the world 
then humanity is lost, not in the sense of its souls, which would be a moot point, but in the survival of our very bodies, as our species will die off and be annihilated by the critical emergency of natural catastrophes. Now, we just had a massive earthquake last night in California. It shook my own home and residence in San Francisco. I was awake through the night. I, of course, am used to such things. But we're going to suffer a planet quake, a world quake. In societal and catastrophic natural changes. The result, of course, will be on a fallback towards that which was here before the nation state. Though the nation state was incepted by Adam Mann and ultimately evolved to be the preeminent sense of identity in the world today. For a large part of man's existence, the nation state was a nascent concept. For the majority of man's existence, identity was race and faith. In the high Middle Ages, throughout the medieval era, there was no such thing as politics. A man's religion was his politics. And in the new dark age, we're going to return to more of a state of faith identity as we deal with a crisis that's going to have us all praying on our knees. So with that in mind, under a concept of national socialism that can be complemented and contained in its worst elements with a sense of industrial modernization based on core areas of industry already industrialized that act as megapolies or super economies to help raise the standard of living and quality of life in areas that we can't afford to have industrialized and indeed need to deindustrialize. This will result in a number of rather autarkic empires aligned with supercultures or supercultures that will dominate the planet in cooperation and conflict as we employ what resources Earth can still provide to relocate the human species in part onto the other planets of our solar system and ultimately among the stars. So with that, I'll close off for tonight. My vision of Vulcan intervention should be a bit more concretized by this point. My love unto all who support me. And I look forward to working with you. And the next beating I provide you come this Saturday weekend, Sunday, during the weekend of Saturday's Epiphany. Blessed be till then. chance to evaluate how, how the stream is going okay wonderful i'm going to uh look forward to your link as soon as that's in there i'll publish it on the pages and then uh you know uh we'll of course look forward to everyone telling us about what they hear or 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 the like and uh other than that uh we are uh basically kind of just uh waiting for the top of the hour and uh what we'll do is uh get our friend uh our executive producer mr uh if if you're interested i thought of a tongue twister just for yes. that uh, pronunciation at some at some advanced level we'll, we'll cover it but uh sure okay. i'm um, i'm just loading the page that's going to oh. give me the link and uh yeah it's telling me we are live so right now there is still nobody connected but 
I got the link copied and uh, I'm going to transfer it to to yourself right here. Excellent. Okay, so it's uh, it's been forwarded Wonderful. to yourself. So now uh, you'll be able to disseminate it further. And I might do the same. Uh, now, what okay. what I like is as I was logging in, this is That's uh, funny. How this is why I, inter I interrupted because I wanted to say, wow, I'm uh, amazed at the uh, you know more subscribers and the views. It looks like people were really viewing uh, in the last uh, transmission. So uh, that's a very nice way to uh, welcome back to uh -huh. YouTube streaming, okay. man. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. So uh, anyhow, okay. Uh, so do you have the link? Okay. Douglas? Oh, that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. I I believe so, but it's got the photograph of myself and my surrogate ah, son on so it. Uh, is that is okay. that intended? That's just kind so, of. Uh, I, yeah. That's weird. It should be. didn't update. Okay. It should be. I, I, I said it so that. Oh, okay. That's just you know what. That's just through that link. People are seeing an, uh, a directive to uh, to your Facebook. Actually, what I put up is uh, uh, I sir I promote your two Facebook timelines. So what they're actually seeing is a promotion for your Facebook timeline. So I'm gonna grab the okay. graphic and get ready, uh, and then so the uh, the graphic will be up for the night. Okay. okay? So I have to get to okay, Facebook. but the link should be. Uh, let me just. Uh, yeah, let me just. Li okay, I get it. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to just listen to a second to my own echo just to confirm. Yeah, you can confirm. Yeah, it should be that. You'll see what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Wow! What an amazing graphic. Well, this is. Yeah, <laughs> actually, I don't consider that one of my best at all. It's uh, just uh, emphasizing, if anything, uh, the the kind of uh, uh, hangover I have got. I've got. <laughs> know, like, it's the world burning, it's, really, from the time. <laughs> it's the space that that's being wielded. You know, it's like it's, it's it looks like a planet in the palm of the hand. Yes, man, the keymaster. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's what it is. It's it's the world burning. Yeah, it's the it's no, the world it's the... burning and the um it it it's both a kind of uh, yeah thank you desertification uh it, you know which emphasizes kind of like the desert storm the climate change just all the all the all the crap that uh you know goes through the memory when I um you know deal with the world okay so let's uh give everybody this this link. Do you, do you think that uh -huh, like when when those uh, I don't know if it's prophecies or things when they say that the world will like end in fire do you think that's like a metaphorical uh, fire that the planet has to go through now and then like some just like normal fire like you were describing in those previous transmissions where really our forest should be tended through fire like we should be more uh, uh, more managing the land uh, through like burn, brush fires and burns right uh is it uh is it like a metaphor word controlled thing? burns <laughs> do, do <you> even... <laughs> i i think that that's a wonderful that's that's wonderful i think that that's 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 probably the most positive interpretation of uh of, of the way it should be um understood uh biblical prophecy and all the uh uh, in any concept such as that is uh, that that's very constructive. I appreciate that. Uh, I think yeah. that's wonderful. I think that's wonderful. Wait, now tell us something actually entertaining. Tell us about how your tire fucking popped and how you had to hitchhike oh, home and how you know uh, the big ugly truck driver attempted to rape you and uh, <laughs> then you had to escape and then uh, you know what, what exactly <laughs> happened with all that? Uh, I I know he had to get home. <laughs> he didn't have uh, a chance you're, to call you're the police because like, he had to get like home to do this. There so. I had a I had a major fucking rig on my ass when the tire like went, <laughs> went out. <laughs> it was whoa! I, like I was on. There's a actually this is an actually yeah this is an interesting little sort of factoid uh, about the highway that I was on. This is it's by number signs. It's the 401, but it has a name. I think P Patriots Way or something like that. But the 401 is renowned across Canada. It's actually the Trans Canada part of the Trans Canada Highway anyway. It runs across Toronto, the north, and uh, I was going out. I was going to take like a short hike uh, somewhere up here, and then come back. Uh, you know, in plenty of time. So I left like late, not late actually, early afternoon. Um, and uh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, as I was, as I just got on this massive highway, this highway, 
By statistics, when I last looked, it was the second busiest highway in North America t- uh, to Santa Monica Freeway, apparently. Though the study, this is like oh, 10 years shit. back. Yeah, we like, we. Ha- this is a very uh, populated place overall. What's called the go- Golden Horseshoe. Uh, so yeah, but anyway, so I'm on this highway that's like uh-huh. super busy with rigs and I'm on the collectors. Luckily, I didn't go in the expressway, though uh, it's possible from there. And I just kept, and as I uh, like got f- just okay. far enough, about four exits from where I got on, the back tire, the whole car starts shaking, like shaking more. And I go, oh no, this, this isn't, it's not usually, the muffler doesn't oh. usually do that, right? Ah, ah, <laughs> and, really, and it just kind of, as I, as I kind of increased the speed, it sort of slowed down. So the vibration kind of calmed down. I go, okay, that's kind of weird. So maybe one of the tires, like re- you remember recently, I had to leave the car because the front tire uh, uh, like popped like uh, or um, ran out of air uh, or it deflated, <laughs> you know, slowly. But anyway, right, so right. it got that, the front tires were repaired, but the back tire, it just blew out. Um, and uh, I managed to like pull over to the shoulder, inspect it, and it was pretty torn up. And uh, right now it's kind of left. It's got to be picked up uh, oh, again. It's getting. It's just taking getting taken care of uh, now. Hopefully, <laughs> so I might. Uh, I might have to go and pick up phone calls actually. Oh about, Jesus! Uh, about six field, but uh, yeah. Right. Okay. Unpleasant man. Busy highways <laughs> and pop tires. Okay. Oh man. Well, we're glad you survived. Oh, my fucking God. If anything had happened to you, that would have been terrible. And uh, I also appreciate the fact that... uh, Yeah, I'm sorry. (laughs) Yeah, 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 I know. You wouldn't like that either. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But... uh, Okay, so... um, One thing I do appreciate also... Yeah, sorry. Go on. So the graphic is up now in the stream. Managed to get the what? The graphic. The graphic for Oh, oh, fabulous. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Already. So we're good. Uh, beautiful. I'm check beautiful. What YouTube beautiful. Us, beautiful. You are free to take mm-hmm. over, essentially. And uh, let me see. Right, right. Well, since he's just got the graphic up, it, uh, we'll see if that appears or changes on the link. That's interesting because no, the no, link still manifests for the moment because you just got the graphic. Yeah, I don't, I still don't manifests think the, the the picture I, of uh, my surrogate son and myself. I don't think the link will change, Douglas. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to change. It may not change for a while. No. The, That's the right. Okay, that though, makes sense. That makes sense. That's fine. Has, That's the, fine. Yeah. The live stream has, and I can see people are beginning okay. to connect. So That's fine. I mean, it, it's... Last time, last time it okay, took us... Okay, wonderful. It took us... A, wonderful, wonderful. It took us like a full... Sometimes 15 to 45 minutes before everybody's actually like, you know, properly in... To what's going on and uh that i know it is last time yeah uh, mm-hmm. it's mostly through the second and third hour that uh people were connected uh the first hour like it was good but uh it, it took uh-huh. a little while okay. for some people to find us i guess i'm not sure <laughs> something mm-hmm. but yeah so anyway it is right. beginning though we're right. beginning well i put up the heading the, to the top of the hour and the stream is fabulous everything's good fabulous fabulous I just, I don't great, have the great. details. Great, And uh, let's see now, Ramona. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, it, it, uh, okay. You, you don't have the details ready. So Ramona Halitha Henry says it has changed. The graphic has changed uh, on her end, which is fine. Not in the link on my pages, but it's changed at her end, which is fine. For the viewer. It's changed for the viewer. Okay. Um, and uh, God knows I haven't got the best voice in the world tonight, but um, we'll, we'll do what we can for at least four hours. <laughs> the, um... <laughs> Ah, and uh, if, oh, I'll feel better as I start talking. Hopefully, um, oh, it's been raining. Yes, doctor. It's been raining. Hey, hey. Oh yeah, it was it was super Sorry. cold here when yes. I was coming back. Yeah. So I, I decided to walk right from. I left it at the mm-hmm. bottom of a ramp of a highway, um, like a uh, you know a ramp off ramp that comes off the exit ramp. So I left it at the end. So. Mm-hmm. With the flashers on, uh, so it's got to get picked up. But um, mm-hmm. I walked after mm-hmm. it, and uh, what was I going to say? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it was cold up here. It uh, the though there was no snow coming down. Sometimes it would snow. It was cold. Jesus. It was probably minus ten. Oh, thank God! <laughs> so fun. Mm-hmm. My, Jesus, my butt cheek, my butt cheeks froze. Oh fuck! <laughs> how do you that. how do you survive something? 
I had, yeah, a, Jesus. I had a very good oh, you coat. Poor bastard. Yeah. Jesus, that's awful. Oh, thank God. Thank God. I mean, he says his butt cheeks, bro. You hear that shit? I mean, forget yeah. the goddamn bus cheeks. I mean, how about your <laughs> testicles? What happened to your testicles? Yeah, exactly, they must man. have that's shriveled. That's the other part that was cool. So, see, I do the cryogenics for uh, for the firms. <laughs> oh, my God. I froze my, I froze yeah, my oh, own semen. Just, I actually <laughs> didn't catch exactly what you said. I said I said I do oh, my yes, own that's I right. my I was own about to say, talk about controlled temperature. Yeah. <laughs> I did my own yeah, cryogenics. Thank you. Thank you. There we are. I was about to say that. Con <laughs> yes. Controlled temperature uh, uh, preservation of a sperm. Yes. yes. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm so glad I don't live there. <laughs> oh, it's bad you. enough where I'm at. Jeez, I'm under an electric blanket now. Yes. Oh shit. That well, Canada and Siberia, right? I mean, Jesus. Uh -huh. they're, they're they're both. As far as I'm concerned, that's that's you know, you know where like, where they sentence people to uh, to for punishment. You know, um, you know what's surprising is that um, the latitude where I, uh, like right. this place is uh, like placed or located is kind of around where Yugoslavia or the old <laughs> Yugoslavia is located. So overall, it's actually like. You know, relatively to Europe, this would be like a pretty temperate zone. But it's, I guess it's how the Atlantic current, how it hits Europe and I guess keeps it warmer or something. But yeah, this should be, we should. It, it's true. It's true. Wise, it should be same, yeah. same temperature or same, uh, same, uh, you know, uh, same climate as, uh, as you go, as kind of like sort of north of Greece and there. And going up through Yugoslavia and Slovenia and there, Croatia and yeah. Serbia. Forty-four or forty-fifth. Uh, uh -huh. No, no, or, it's an excellent point. Yeah. Right. Okay, we're almost at the right. five seconds. That's, that's right. Yes, it's amazing how far. Yeah. Top of.